Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a very cute, fluffy and silly start to our sunset safari live in the African bush. My first troop of baboons for the cycle and I'm really excited that they're out and about in the midday sun. My name is Tess. I will be taking on an epic adventure this afternoon. Behind the camera is Igor. <laughs> Are you waving with your shadow? <laughs> It's already a good start to the sunset safari. The baboons are slowly coming up from Gauri Dam. It is scorchingly hot. 33 degrees Celsius, which is 92 degrees Fahrenheit. I can tell you in the sun, we are cooking. So I can only imagine the animals will be as well. So hopefully we'll be doing some shade hopping. We're going to go down to the Mulawati, do some dam hopping and just enjoy everything that we find today. I don't know where the baboons are all going to be heading to. Maybe the top end of quarantine. They're slowly moving towards the back of the car now, but the rest of the troop should be following soon. I'm going to give them a little bit of space to keep moving and then I'll reverse, because if I reverse now while they're already on the move close to us, they might disappear. Oh, here's the rest of the troop eagle coming on the right. Yay! I want to see some little baby baboons. They are so much fun. But it's always nice to start with one of our primates out here, incredibly intelligent, very playful and uh, full of mischief <laughs> but if there's anything you would like us to try and look for for you this afternoon if you have any questions for us anything you'd like us to chat about please do let us know we're really keen to hear it and it'll definitely make our day to give us another goal to look for if you have something specific in mind Jamie Lee, I agree. A Tawny Tuesday sunset safari would be the best thing ever, I think. I'm going to reverse a little bit. They look like they're going along the fence line towards camp. <sighs> that sounds mischievous. <laughs> but it's so nice to just see them and actually spend some time with the bees. We're catching up slowly, don't you worry. We are coated in sunblock, we've got lots of water with us today and of course some nice wet kikois to try and keep us cool from the sun. Oh, and we found some impalas that are wanting to follow the baboons even better and to top it off, eagle, a patch of shade. Yay! This is very exciting. So quite typical on any safari to see baboons surrounded by other animals joining other animals or being joined by other animals and that includes these impalas the baboons are running around <laughs> headed straight towards the big marulas on quarantine and i'm sure they have one thing in mind definitely looking for marula fruits the impalas are the same Heather, baboon troops average probably anywhere between 20 and 50 members in this area of, of South Africa. But the biggest troop I've seen was probably close to 150, maybe 200 baboons. But it's going to depend area to area. It'll depend on the density of baboons and the amount of space, the resources. But I suppose the average would probably be closer to about 40 to 50 in a troop. And it's quite interesting how they're governed too, because they tend to have multiple dominant males. Because the troops can get so big, it, it'll be a bit much for one male to handle the defense and protection of the group. Oh, listen to them. And so you'll have one really dominant male and then the others will work around him. And they kind of surround the troop, they bring up the front, the sides and the rear, just to keep everybody nice and safe. Baboons are one of a leopard's pet peeves. They love chasing baboons. So having big males around which have canines bigger than a leopard's is definitely quite handy. And this is one of them that looks like a pretty big male to me. Got a bit of a strut. Baboons are exceptionally well known for their sharp eyesight and of course having a vantage point like trees when they do want to climb them is exceptionally good for every other animal that follows the troops around because they're a great early warning system for predators. 
particularly for leopards. The feeling between leopards and, and baboons is very much mutual. They don't like each other. Okay, let's see if we can move again. They've all abandoned us. When I say abandoned, they haven't actively tried to leave the area, otherwise they would have been totally gone. But they're very much making a beeline for those marilla trees, so I think there are some fruits ready to be eaten there. It's such a gorgeous day. And with the lush greenery the way it is at the moment, marula fruits everywhere, the flannel weeds that are causing this beautiful yellow glow, lush, thick bush, it's just stunning. The baboons might in fact be leaving us. But at least the impalas aren't. I can't even see baboons anymore. So the flannel weeds are so long that it's any animal that's low down to the ground is quite tough to see. But that little kind of lump on a baboon's tail and its head you can sometimes see. The impalas will probably follow the baboons if they do decide to climb a marula and start picking fruits. The, that baboon at least is still feeling friendly because <laughs> the baboons when they're jumping around knock marillas out the trees oh sorry would you please repeat that question for me i know it was from dark mane lover but i did not hear the whole question i just heard elephants Oh, that is a very interesting question. Thank you, Dark Mane Lover. I think when we're measuring intelligence in animals, it's very difficult to compare different species unless there is something very different, like comparing mammals to maybe reptiles. But even then, we have very limited knowledge on how to measure intelligence in animals. Elephants are particularly intelligent, but so are baboons. Baboons are primates and they're incredibly closely related to us. So they're very good at problem solving. They're very good at at all sorts of very intense things and because both animals are very gregarious they value social structure a lot that immediately would tell us that they are capable of of handling social interactions they're capable of doing it in a group and they're capable of managing their own hierarchy that in itself says a lot and then you look at um, you know things like okay well we can test ourselves on the ABCs and things like that, but how do we test an elephant and measure it against a baboon? I don't know if we'd ever be able to. When you study the brains of the animals using scans or anything like that, it can tell us quite a lot, but it tells us more which centers of the brain are bigger. And both of them have a pretty large emotional center of the brain, and both of them have a pretty large center of the brain that is associated with problem solving and intelligence. So I don't know how I would actually compare the two of them. What would you say, Igor? It's tough. It's super tough. It is very, very tough. I, I will say though that they are two of what we consider the highest ranking animals in terms of intelligence out here. We share, I don't know if you know this, but we share majority of our basic DNA with baboons. <laughs> Over 90% of our DNA is common with baboons. So primates are incredibly closely related to humans. And then you look at that and compare it to elephants. We, we share DNA with elephants, but not as much as with the primates. And uh, how would we compare intelligence then, even elephants to humans? It's a very, very difficult one to answer. But I hope that that kind of gave you an idea of, of how we look at intelligence out here. I'm sorry I can't give you a definite answer, but I don't know if anyone will ever be able to, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. How do we measure intelligence? Because we can't give them an ABCs course and ask them to repeat it back. We can't test their IQ or even their EQ. So <laughs> it's very difficult to, to tell. But I'm happy that these ones at least came back. They look like they're sticking to the shade of the marillas, I suppose, double advantage. Shade and fruits, very good this time of the year. But we're gonna stick around and see what the troop gets up to. It's always fun to follow them. And we'll send you over to have a look at what the weather is doing for the afternoon.
think that the baboon than we are. So is the Swainson spur file as it pecks through some elephant dung and it's in the shade. Not like the humans out driving around on safari who decide to park in the direct sunlight. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Paul, and we are here at Juma Private Game Reserve on this wonderful live safari. So please remember to send through your questions. I can't wait to chat to you. Whew. It's hot. I don't even know what the temperature is today. What do you think it is, Paul? 36. 36? Yeah. I think it's closer to 38. At least real feel, maybe 39. It's warm. But anyways, we will we will sacrifice the, the sun for some much needed vitamin D. But um, let's have a look at our bird again. It's lying. I've just been told that the temperature is 33 degrees Celsius. That's a complete fib. The weatherman has got it wrong yet again. It's not, it can't be 33. It's so hot. Anyways, I wish that I was this uh, spur file because I'm also a little bit hungry, peckish. I don't know if we are into the same things. I don't normally dig open dung and look for insects and partially digested seeds and kind of anything else that the elephants might have been eating. Um, but this is mo probably the longest sighting I've ever had of a Swainson spur file, although we had a good one the other day. They're normally quite shy birds. When I say, when I say shy, I don't think they like to be out in the open uh, for too long because they're very vulnerable to all sorts of, all kinds of predation really. But uh, that's why it's sort of peck, peck, peck and then stops and not actually even looking around, it's just looking at us. We won't eat you. Look up. That's where your threats are going to be coming from, for the most part. Of course, there's lots of pre uh, predators down on the ground too. But uh, it's always quite amusing. I'm, I'm sad that there isn't uh, an, another bird here, maybe with some chicks, because we're seeing a lot of the ground really birds running around with chicks at the moment, and they would love this. They would love to be uh, sort of scraping through uh, this dung. And then at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, you can even see a little dung beetle making a... Uh, a getaway with its if with its meal it's quite funny if you look very carefully uh, uh, the the third from the right but the bottom quadrant you'll see a little dung beetle just rolling its ball away so this pile of elephant dung has provided plenty this afternoon I bet if I go digging in there I might find myself a, a, a undigested my ruler fruit uh, my ruler fruit that's not what they're called my ruler fruit I don't know why I said that um, and I'm sure that there are plenty of little bugs as well just uh, feeding on the moisture that would have been left behind. Oh my goodness! I feel very privileged this afternoon, and Paul. Hilary Duff has greeted us by name my goodness i knew there was a reason why i was brought to this planet or put on this earth shall i say <laughs> no i'm glad thank you so much yeah we're looking forward to the drive as well i'm definitely looking to forward to after 5 p.m when it starts to cool down a little bit and uh, hopefully some of the cats or hyenas or wild dogs will start to get a little bit more active but for now we'll just focus on the smaller things which is my favorite thing, of course, to do. I mean, that bird is really having a fun time. You are nibbling away. It always amazes me that the, the smell of the dung doesn't necessarily bother the birds. And it's quite, it's quite pungent, but apparently not pungent enough to deter the Swainson spur file. Okay, so we have managed to reposition a little bit at least, found ourselves some shade and we are waiting for the baboons to come to us now. Unbelievably, half the troop has completely disappeared. We don't know where they've gone, maybe they're already on their way past camp. But at least we're seeing this kind of last little bit of the family sitting around in the grass. Very tough to tell in the long flannel weeds, but we're hoping that we get some movement from them soon and that we'll see them picking up some marula fruits. They are a lot of fun when they're playing and have lots of energy from those fruits. They 
There was a big one coming towards us that's just turned around. I'm trying to find him. But even the impalas are slowly coming over. Is that where the big one disappeared? <laughs> Sitting at the base of the tree watching the world come past. Seems like a good thing to do on an afternoon in the bush. Just sit and watch the world. They normally make quite a bit of noise, but I'm not even hearing them now. I'm sure a lot of them are up the trees and we can't see them in the canopies. <sighs> Is that one that I'm seeing there, Eagle? Mm. Up in the tree? I'm not really sure. Uh, yes, that tree dead center now. At the back, almost kind of in the bottom reaching branches. Is it branches? Wow. That's definitely a baboon. Okay, at least Igor's capable of spotting animals. At least one of us is good at that, hey? <laughs> Gotta have at least one per vehicle. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome up here to a sunny and warm Madikwe where we have caught up with a small breeding herd of elephants with many more in the background coming here to join. I hope you are all well this afternoon. Hello everybody, my name is Steve and I'm joined by Rihanna and Camera and we are out and about in the wilds of Madikwe to find all sorts of wonderful animals for you this afternoon. Our plan is to head over towards the centre of Madikwe, where we're going to hopefully get to a place called Klo Dam. Now, Klo is the Twana word for elephant. And uh, I tried to get there last time um, along this road. And this road is a very good all weather road. But on the way to Klo Dam, there's a lot of red, clay, black cotton soil roads when I last came. And it was a little bit sketchy. So I ended up turning around and coming all the way back. So we never got as far. But if you recall, in November when I was here, there was lots of rain. And that is evident by the fullness of the watering holes, the greenness of the vegetation, and uh, the happiness of our elephants. So if you missed the sunrise safari this morning, please do go back and have a little watch. There was an incredible few moments we had with four brown hyena, some jackal feeding on a giraffe carcass. At one point there were two spotted hyenas, but they were quite reluctant to be filmed for some reason. And it was a first for me to, to spend time like that with a brown hyena so very very special moments indeed and dung beetle doodle i love my elephants they like me too and uh, i just have to hang out somewhere and they'll come and find me they'll come and find me there are some more up ahead i think maybe let's get a little bit closer to them around what do you think we were giving this lady here with her youngster a bit of space <laughs> We wanted to get ensconced. That is a word that previous colleague Jamie Patterson used to love using, ensconced. We wanted to get ensconced by the herd, but I also wanted to give this lady and her youngster the benefit of her boundaries, not to push past. It's very important to be ethical. We are here as visitors in these safari lands, and we're here to visit and view the animals in their natural state. 
If they're sleeping, they're sleeping. If they're walking, they're walking. If they are hiding in the bush, that is what they're doing. We're not here to influence. We're not here to create or cause them any form of a reaction. But uh, we do rather like spending time with elephants. And there's a big bull here amongst this grouping. Let's just move up ahead. We're on the way to Clo Dam. So we'll see what we see. But let's just get up here a little bit. There's at least two breeding herds here and a bull. Could be more. Three breeding herds. Sure, if you got those around, that was pretty broken up in my ear there. I didn't get, didn't get all of that. I'm afraid, Morgan, in the mission control. If you can repeat that, I'd be most appreciative. <laughs> wow, Kelly, that's a good question. What is my favourite elephant fact? I just love elephants. I don't, none of the facts are really that exciting for me. I just love the energy they give off. I love their sentient nature. I love the fact that they are very inquisitive and that they're very curious and that they are hugely massive animals that move through the landscape and yet they are so gentle and calm and placid. I love that. I love the little ones and how they behave, how they think they're much bigger than they are, and charge us every now and again. That's got to be one of the most favorite things. But uh, one of the most favorite things to do is to be approached by elephants, for the biggest of the biggest to physically come into your space, to say hi, and to just say hello, and to not cause you harm. They're just curious. I find that incredible, incredible, incredible. One of the most amazing things is their gestation period. It's 22 months. I can't imagine that's such a long period of time. It's no doubt why the bond between mother and youngster is so strong. You know, I know a number of mothers who are quite bonded to their children, and that's only nine months in the womb. 22 months, can you imagine? Very, very long time. Mm. And Kelly, they are just such fascinating animals and probably some of the best and entertaining animals to watch because you know, even though it's the heat of the day there's still something going on, you know, they're still moving, they're still walking, they're still doing their thing and we've positioned ourselves in the sort of position that um, they've got lots of space they come as close to us as they want to and I love that they do I mean, Kelly, I suppose one of the most fascinating facts is the silence. I mean, what, there's 25 of them here? I know for a fact I've taken six or eight people on a walk and we make far more noise than these 25 elephants do. 
So how quietly they can emerge, disappear, is fascinating. youngster feeding in the shade. These animals are a little bit wet, which means they've probably been at a wallow somewhere. Might just be a little side hustle on the road, something that's not too major. There's nothing major on the map too close by, but we are headed towards one of the major water sources I've been told on the reserve called Plow Dam and that's still a little way away from here. So we're going to move on from my elephants and uh, see if we can get you to other watering hole. Ladies are coming. Jason, while I'm being cinematic. Ah, ah, ah. Sorry. <laughs> From the sublime to the ridiculous, everybody. Of that ethereal and unattainable thing, the happy marriage. Very nice to see him. <laughs> this is an unbelievable afternoon. <laughs> Shame the one little goose there seems to have a bit of a limp. Mum and Dad is now taking them on a little walk now just to go out and uh, experience a little bit of land-based education. And to obviously eat and feed. They're getting to the stage now where they are really close to going on their own. 
within about two weeks or so, I reckon they would go on their own. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris, and with me on camera ops is Panda. And our plan this afternoon, for now, we're just going to remain in the shade. It is very, very hot here at Pridelands at the moment. And what we're going to do is we're going to stay with those geese for a bit. There's quite a bit of elephants around at the moment coming in and out. So I'm hoping to stay here and get a few elephants. If you look at the geese. I can see one of them actually have a, a bit of a limp now. It's not something I'd worry about. It is a very common species. And we, got, we are bound to have some mortalities in a little uh, clutch like that. Not a litter, but a clutch of, of geese like that. And that is one of the reasons why they have so many uh, young or goslings. Uh, they are high on the list in terms of predation. It's a lot of things I would love to get their hands on one of those little chicks. And it's just the flow of energy. Remember we speak a lot about the flow of nutrients and energy and carbon and so forth. Remember the predators also need food. So you'll you'll hear me a lot referring to the energy flow. And it's not a it's not a placebo thing. It's real. There is a need to flow. Energy cannot be created. It can only be transferred. And therefore it ha there's an energy cycle. There's a cycle of nutrients. There's a carbon cycle. There's a nitrogen cycle. There's a water cycle. All these things keeps on cycling through the environment. Some goes very quick, some takes years and ages to do. And therefore all these components are vital. Hi there, Nicola. Nicola says, loves those little goslings. Very, very cute. Where are they now? Let's try and see if we can get them again. I think they've gone now. All right. Well, that looks pretty nice. You still got them there, Panda? All right, cool. Looks like they are picking up some leaves. And remember, they are leaf eaters by large. They do consume a few small other invertebrates and so forth. But essentially, these guys eat leaves. Always nice to start off our afternoon with the goslings. They're kind of like becoming a little temporary characters out here at Eco Training Pryland. And we've got two pairs. We are now at Ndlovodam, which is in the central parts of Pridelands itself, very close to the Eco Training campus for the students. And there's another one in the northwestern parts, another couple. Or, or pair of geese uh, around a dam we refer to as Leopard Dam. I'm sure you've heard about Leopard Dam before. And they are a lot younger than these. They are born a little bit later. Like I said, they mainly plant eaters, but actually grazers. And they'll also strip grass seeds as well, something they also strip off grasses as well. Sedges, all sorts of things, herbs. Anyway, let's head over to Tessa to see what she is up to at Juma. We are getting up close and personal with these baboons here in Juma. They are loving the shade of this marilla tree and they have not stopped picking up fruits. Now these are some of the larger individuals. I have no idea where the smaller ones went. We've seen a little bit of movement here and there in the trees, but I think the grass and the flannel weeds are so long that we're struggling to see the smaller ones. So these definitely look like adult baboons and for the most part male as well 
So perhaps the rest of the family is safely tucked away somewhere up in the trees eating the fruits up there where it is a little safer. But it looks like... So the ones on the right are standing up. There's two on the right there. Okay, now they're sitting down. The ones on the left have been lying flat on their stomachs in the flannel weeds. I think just enjoying the breeze. Very human-like and that's exactly what baboons are known for is displaying a lot of human-like behavior. They are after all primates and a very close relative of ours. And I think that's why in particular we enjoy watching them so much because we see a lot of human-like behavior in them. It definitely changes how we look at them. And we are quite close to camp, so if you do hear any voices, that's why. But I did want to expand on your question, Dark Mane Lover, because myself and Igor have been chatting about this extensively. Extensively. And trying to figure out an adequate scale that is equal to measure things like baboons against elephants, against something like even dolphins or orcas, because of course Igor is from the coast and he has a passion for marine life. They are known as exceptionally intelligent as well, but I think the best way to measure it is maybe against man and against other primates in particular. You can measure them against each other by studying the different brains amongst one single group. But to then compare from primates, say, to example, or say, for example, from primates to something like a hyena would be very difficult. So in order from humans, which are considered the most intelligent, after that you'll have... Gorillas? Oh yes, chimps. You're right. Chimps first, and then gorillas, and then orangutans, and then baboons. So they're actually considered the fourth most intelligent in relation to the other primates and next to humans. But I don't think that that is an adequate scale to go off of all round. Because I don't know if there would be things like orcas or uh, elephants that fit in somewhere in between that scale, but it seems that that is the way it has been ranked so far is is humans, chimps, gorillas, orangutans, baboons. Those would be the the five most intelligent that that we have on the planet. <laughs> five most intelligent species. So <laughs> considered the fourth most intelligent behind humans. I just don't know if that would be fair to measure them without including things like elephants, hyenas, orcas, you know, dolphins. But there was a study, supposedly a French study, that showed that baboons learned over 7,800 different words. And they got over a 75% success rate of teaching them these words. And some of them were actual words that we would use, like kettle. And some of them were made up words, but they kept those made up words consistent. And apparently there were baboons that could recognize as much as 300 words and associate them with the correct things. So, I mean, that is really impressive. <laughs> I didn't know that. Did you know that, Eagle? I had no idea. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff that, that we can find out from these incredible primates. But I think... You know, outside of learning words and things like that, there's a lot of other things that baboons show that maybe not a lot of other mammals do. Uh, lions can, I suppose. Hyenas might from a certain age. But one of the most fascinating things about baboon troops is that young baboons practice being parents, which not a lot of other species do. So young baboons that are not yet sexually mature will babysit. They'll actively go and, and look after other females' little ones. And what they'll do as well is if a female is in trouble and she dies and she orphans a little one, they actually take the little one in and treat it as their own, even though they are not yet themselves sexually mature. So that is something you don't see in a lot of species, particularly from immature individuals. You might see it in lionesses feeding another lioness's cubs, for example, with aloe suckling, but that is very different because she already has cubs of her own. For an immature to do that, it gives that immature a lot of experience for when they are a mom themselves or a dad. The males have even been known to do it when they're young. But it also means that they are capable of realizing that that little one is in trouble, it has been orphaned and it needs help. And that, I think, is a pretty impressive measure of emotional intelligence combined with, with intellect. So that, to me, is really fascinating.
you know, we're looking at them sitting in the grass, you're thinking, you guys are eating marulas, you're having the best time, relaxing in the shade, but in fact, there's a lot more going on with baboons than people give them credit for. And to see them out here like this, natural environment, just loving life, it's, you know, it's a successful troop of baboons, there's a lot we can learn from them. There's a lot more impalas coming in to join these five in the shade. Mallory, I'm so happy that you enjoyed that. It's always nice to learn new things and for us it's a great way to to spark these conversations because after all that's how that's how we learn out here a lot of the time is conversation. Other than reading, it's conversation with each other to bounce opinions, bounce ideas, and uh, throw some spanners in the works. <laughs> sometimes literally and sometimes actually just in conversation. But <laughs> we really do learn a lot from these kinds of conversations and trying to measure it against different things because I wouldn't have actually thought of orcas. Igor brought up orcas because of his, his knowledge of marine animals is much better than mine. And I would have tried to compare them to elephants and hyenas and some of the other really intelligent ones here, but orcas I would not have thought of. And now that he brought it up, I can't ignore it because I know how intelligent they are. Just it wouldn't have occurred to me because we don't get them here. <laughs> orcas in Juba? No, I don't think we get orcas in Juba. I think they are dolphins occasionally in the Malawati. <laughs> How amazing, we've got a whole line of baboons now, six of them. It literally looks like they're lying down, right? I think they are, they're lying down and as they're lying on their stomachs, they're lying flat on their bellies, some of them. They're picking up fruit. The ultimate combination of relaxing and eating. <laughs> Marula and chill, that one's got a little baby on her back. <laughs> Vanessa, it really is scorchingly hot across the, the different locations this afternoon. We're in full-blown summer. Doesn't feel like the start of the year anymore <laughs> when we started off cold. But thank you, I do think we, we enjoy a nice relaxing relaxing time in the shade i mean for us you know we don't really get to spend time with baboons an awful lot so when we do get to we have to take advantage it's always entertaining there's bound to be something crazy that happens at some point where did that little one go so I didn't see any tiny, tiny newborns in this troop. When I say newborn, I mean still has the pink face clinging to mom's belly, very black fur. I didn't see any of those. But I saw a couple of baboons that were at least a few months old, still small enough to ride on mom's back or hang on her tummy like that one was just now, sitting on mom's back. But I'd love to see tiny little newborn baboons in this troop. They're always a lot of fun to watch because they're clumsy. Very clumsy. No, I didn't. No. I think you are imagining things. I was about to say that Eagle's thinking is hearing lions roaring, but it's a bit hot for that. I wouldn't think there'd be any lions awake now unless there's something serious going on. <laughs> yes, a lot of people hear imaginary dogs barking or children crying. That's normal though. It is, I don't know, I mean, it is normal to, to hear things like that, especially new moms. <laughs> Baboons are the same. <laughs> If they uh, hear a little baby crying, the mom's going to overdrive. Hello, troop of baboons. I 
I wonder how many marula fruits a big male eats in a day. It would be a lot this time of the year. I'm sure he stuffs those cheek pouches full and then still swallows a whole lot more. I'm hoping that those youngsters that were playing around in the trees on the other side are going to come closer. I haven't seen them moving in a bit, so I'd imagine they found a nice spot to hang out up in the tree. Maybe having a midday nap. They are young, they run out of energy a bit faster. And then when it bursts, it really bursts. But for now, it's quite relaxed. These adults are just soaking in the extra vitamin C. We'll give it another minute here and then we'll leave the baboons to enjoy their afternoon. I think they would be very happy if we found a leopard far away from here. <laughs> but we can at least know that when there are baboons around, if they are incredibly relaxed, the chances of there being a leopard around are quite low. Because they're so alert and they have those kind of sentries that sit around specifically watching for predators, especially when the troop is on the ground with babies. They have baboons that actively watch for predators. So I think it's fairly safe to say that they are around. They're probably high up in the trees where we can't even see them. It's safe to say that there might not be a leopard close to this big open area. But that would make sense. It's hot. So if I was a leopard, I would be in the Mulawati, and that's exactly what my next step is going to be. I'm going to go towards Gari Dam, the main dam on Juma, and then head straight into the riverbed. My favorite spot for birding, for shade, and a nice breeze that attracts all of those animals, from elephants to leopards to even the insects. Hello and welcome to the Amakala Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape Province of South Africa. While we're watching this giraffe just sort of head off across over the road, my name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera I've got BK with me. How's it BK? And how's it to all of you once again? Well, this uh, lovely giraffe bull has just gone out of view on the side there. So just give me a second just to turn so that we can see him nicely because he is a lovely specimen and he's just gone to go and feed over there looks like on a sweet thorn bush. So we've come out into these parts because we'd like to try and catch up with the lions. Um, I've been circling around where they have been seen in the last few days with the little cubs uh, but we haven't spotted them just yet. It's rather hot today, so I'm pretty sure that they'll be lying up in the shade somewhere. As will the cheetah boys, who I want to go and look for next. Um, and just to report, uh, yesterday, late yesterday afternoon, uh, it was reported that they caught themselves a little baby piglet warthog. So that would have given them a nice boost and shame as that giraffe just walks past the pole we'll see him there now again so the cheetah have been able to catch themselves something at least um, and i'm hoping that today maybe they'll catch themselves something a bit more substantial we know where they are and they're in an area where there are some springbok and blessbok so hopefully if all goes well they'll catch themselves something like that but we'll try and catch up with them i'm pretty sure they will be active again they will be mobile and they'll be on the hunt once more because that little piglet wasn't too much it was almost just like a, a, um, a, a little snack for the three cheetah boys so they do need to eat something else 
and there's one of the animals that would be, do very well for them if they would be able to catch it a blessed book and there were some blessed book babies too but uh, they're off on over the other side of the hill of the the cheetah and we'll head off in that direction shortly and try and catch up with them now that little baby there would be perfect food for the cheetah but I'm pretty sure they'll still be lying around under a bush in the shade just for the time being in the next hour or so though they'll probably get up and uh, be looking to hunt so I hope to be there when that happens when they show themselves we did search for them a little bit earlier and I think uh, they're just a little bit too deep in the thickets for us to be able to see them especially at midday when the sun's directly above us the animals then if they are looking for shade they go right into the middle of these thickets and you'll be amazed at how many of them are actually hollowed out on the inside because um, of the animals going in there and utilizing it for the shade and sometimes I think also getting out of the wind and even when it rains it does uh, provide ample shelter So Maxine, yeah, you do find animals getting into a kind of routine, um, none more so than the elephants. Whenever it's hot, you find them at midday coming down for a drink, a bathe, and then a dust bath, and then they head down into the river valleys, into the back into the shade, where they can then also feed along the river banks. Um, now, obviously, with there being no water in the Bushman's River itself, um, they can actually access the 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 river. Um, floor and they walk through the river itself um, and then they feed on the, the, the very lush trees that are right on the banks of the river which now as I say is dry um, but still very nice for the elephants down there um, and they really enjoy it but they get into that routine um, we also find animals like monkeys and baboons very routine like in their behavior uh, they'll roost up in trees at night and then they come down early morning and you'll find they also sometimes go for a drink to start with then they head off foraging return for another drink and then head up into their roosting sites once more so you find once you sort of work it out you can actually predict what they're going to be doing on a daily basis with the general plains game, the animals, I mean, they stay out here on the, in the open, um, just grazing, ruminating, grazing, ruminating, and then every now and then going for a drink as well, dependent on the, depending on the animal, whether they drink more or less. But yeah, very routine-like in their behavior across the board. see a lot of the babies also sort of resting during this hot or or middle part of the day when it is hot especially takes a lot out of them righty so I'm gonna slowly bumble along and see if we can spot some felids Hopefully we find the lions and the cheetah. So wish me luck and uh, while we try our best, I'm going to send you on over to Stephen. Thanks Ralph and good luck finding your cats. We've made it all the way to the central parts of Medikwe to a watering hole called Tlo, which is the local word for elephant. And you'd think we'd potentially find some elephants here yeah, if we look around and maybe search with our binoculars. Oh my goodness, there they are. <laughs> Well, there's one anyway. We had a couple of boys on this side. We came all the way around to put our backs to the sun because, well, first of all, the light is much better. 
And second of all, we don't sit in the sun. It gets rather warm sitting for a period of time here. Welcome to Tlo Dam. I'd say it's equivalently the same size as Chukuru, where we've spent a bit more time. And we saw a few more elephants on our way through in the thickets hiding out because of the heat of the day. Rock candy says you obviously the sun makes things warm, uh, but many of these animals' feet are well adapted to the temperature on the ground. Uh, elephants have got heavily padded feet, so I don't think it's too hot for them, but that is an interesting question. You know, the earth can get very, very hot. Uh, most of the other animals obviously have got their hooves, so I don't think it affects them. The elephants walk through sickle bush thickets like it's nothing and they don't seem to get affected by the thick thorns so I don't know if heat plays a major part off of the ground that is what an interesting concept what do you think Ryan? No, I don't think so Going to chase all of the geese out of the way. He's a decent sized bull from a distance it's not always easy to tell but as I often talk about the looking at the face you see how wide the tusks are gives a good indication of the elephant's age
so we are just repositioning at Gauri Dam because we had some water buck relaxing in the shade and they've just come over and started sparring on the bank of the big dam. They look like the one on the right is definitely a bigger bull, I think. He looks like his horns are bigger and his body's a little bit bulkier. So I think the one going down to the water's edge now is the more dominant of the two. The one standing facing us has got thinner horns that are a little bit shorter and he looks a bit younger. We are also currently being stalked up to by a female Nyala. Look, she's getting closer. Hello girl. You're very calm. just a hub of activity today and that makes a lot of sense because it is so hot. The dam is the place to be between the Nyalas, the waterbuck, the impalas and birds everywhere. It's just a wealth of movement. I feel quite special. She's feeling safe enough to be right next to us. The impalas not as much. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> she is being quite cute. She's staring at us. She looks nice and rounded. She looks like she might be pregnant. Hello, girl. She's being very careful of the movements that she's hearing. Look at that. She changed her mind. I wonder what she heard behind us. She was looking down almost towards the outflow of the dam. Thank you. I shall try to hold still. Here comes another Nyala to join. think this name is correct. I hope it is Humley. Uh, no, so the stripes on a Nyala don't have anything to do with thermoregulation or temperature regulation. Hello young boy. Oh Tandy. Wow that was way off. I'm so sorry. Tandy no, so they don't have anything to do with controlling the body temperature. It's not quite the same as with a zebra that has very pronounced thick stripes that are of such different contrasting colors. The purpose of the stripes on a kudu and on a nyala and even the spots on a bushbuck are just simply just to break up the shape, break up the outline and that's because they prefer a habitat that is slightly more overgrown. So yes we do find them here in the open clearings but they prefer to have a little bit of cover and so the stripes, when it's walking in amongst the dense bushes, kind of just breaks up the outline to the eye. And so it, it helps as a form of camouflage. It helps as a form of confusing a predator's eye. So it has developed to keep them safe in slightly thicker environments. Very different to an impala, which has the counter shading technique, which not very many antelopes actually do. The impala and the springbuck are two that I can think of. And the Thompson's gazelle. Although we don't get Springbuck or Thompson's Gazelle here. But the Impala has that very dark red on the top, a kind of cream down the side and white on the belly. Now they're often found in big open areas, so stripes wouldn't do them any good. It would actually draw attention. But counter shading helps them blend into the environment, whether it's with a termite mound that might be sticking out of the grass, or purely not really knowing where the impala is standing because of how it's broken up. Its legs look separate to the rest of its body in that color scheme, especially when it's moving from sun to shade. So that counter shading you'll actually see more often in marine animals like sharks and dolphins. So it's, it's an interesting technique to find out here. There are not very many animals that use that particular technique in, well, land animals anyway, in South Africa. Absolutely gorgeous. It's just so much going on here. One, two, three, four. I thought there was.
there were five waterbuck bulls just now. I can only count four. Maybe one has decided to go and lie down in the shade on the other side. But it certainly looks like everyone's having a great time at Gowrie Dam. Any dam in the heat of the day is going to be an amazing place to be. Particularly the herbivores. Big groups like this, mixed species between birds and different antelopes. Fantastic for keeping you safe. Oh, look at these two having a little cuddle session. They're grooming. Two very young impala lambs. So being in the shade, I suppose, great time to do things other than try and feed. If you're cooling down, you might as well increase those social bonds. <laughs> yeah, those two are definitely decreasing the social bond and increasing it at the same time. They're doing a combination of both these two motorbuck. If they don't move back to the right, I'll pull you a little bit forward, just so they're not obscured by the bush. Yeah, they are having a go at it right there on the bank of the dam. <laughs> Sorry, Rusty. That'll do. So, definitely a bit of a hierarchical interaction. Oh, they've chased each other up the bank now. Hierarchical interaction happening here. The bulls will have a dominance. In the bachelorhood, just like impalas do, just like kudus do. And to challenge that, you play fight. And you play fight until you're confident enough to seriously fight. And then you sort it out like that with horns and with fighting. But they are feeling a little bit more shy now, for sure. They're moving more towards the dam camp. We might see them pop out on the left-hand side. Just remember, we are in front of the camp, so we're not going to <coughs> spend too much time here but just in general it really is a wealth of a wealth of wildlife here today all the plains game or the general game I think everybody's enjoying these animals at the dam today. <laughs> All right, I think what we will do though is before we completely disappear into the sun, I think we are going to head off towards the Malawati into the riverbed to see if we can find a little bit of shade and hopefully a sign of a predator. enjoy the shade we are once again out in the sun because we are not particularly intelligent however we do have a bird and i don't think i've shown you this bird yet. well actually we were trying to show you the other morning and paul and i and then we had the hippo get out the water and walk away from buffalo dam which is here on juma uh, out sort of in the northeastern corner of the reserve so <laughs> can you believe it we didn't continue talking about it but it is a common green shank and I'm so sad though because it was literally on the southern section of the dam maybe two minutes ago quite happily feeding and then it panicked when it when it moved closer to the vehicle and then it was like oh no that's far too close so I'm gonna just go miles away again that could really be anything I could even be a sandpiper but I promise you it is a green shank a common green shank and they are one of our paleoctic migrants so what that basically means is that they don't live here they migrate here during our summers so that they can feed on all the deliciousness and avoid the cold some of the paleoctic migrants will actually breed in South Africa but not these ones these are non-breeding migrants it's quite nice. So basically just a vacation. They leave their, their chicks from 
you know, that year back at home and they say, cheers, off we go. We're going on a summer holiday. And I'm so sad that it has stopped feeding because the technique that it was using was hysterical. So I'm not going to say anything about it right now because I've got faith that this bird is going to, in fact, enter the the dam again and, and sort of start feeding. But they fly a long 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 way to kind of get you but for the most part they find that the species uh, well the common green shank in fact typically when they get the ones that are coming to southern africa all the studies have kind of shown and i'm assuming they ring they ring birds and this is how they get all their information um is that they are sort of from the eastern parts of russia or western sorry western parts of russia my bad um one somewhere in russia i don't know either east or west and those are the ones that frequent these uh, yeah, Southern Africa, which is quite cool. They're quite a big bird, so uh, for me, I don't. I, I typically don't get confused with a sandpiper because they are very large. They're more than the length of a ruler, and they've got a slightly upturned beak as well. <coughs> Welcome back to Clo Dam and to some red-billed quilias sitting in the tree. They've been coming down and doing a little bit of washing, drinking, wetting their bodies, and then they go through the process of preening. Very small birds. Oh, we've got a bit of action up ahead. Elephant running. I'm sure he is Here's the bull that was there before, one on the left. He's walked all the way around the dam, interacted with us, and now he's back where we first saw him, and he was running a moment ago, now that there's another bull there. So what's going on between these two? Have they got some unfinished business? Let's see. Maybe he uh, set a date with his friend and he said, I will see you at that spot at the dam at half past four. And his friend was late. And now he's come back to say, how on earth can you be late? I was here on time. He's walked all the way around the dam in frustration. <laughs> He didn't look very frustrated. They clearly know each other. Their interaction was brief. And they're probably having a little conversation with each other right now. Like, I'm sorry I was a little bit late. You know, we can still do that thing you said we were going to do. Please. both been to different parts of the reserve, one red mud and one dark mud. Quinton, I don't know what other factors could determine a bull's size apart from diet, but genetics is everything. And if you don't have the genetics to be a big animal, you'll never be a big animal. But if you don't get the right food, you'll never sustain that sort of size. You'll never get there initially. So I'm pretty sure genetics plays the majority of the role in the size of these animals. Same as the tusks. That's why we know for a fact the elephants that occurred in Addo for a long time had no tusks because of the selective nature of the ivory hunting that took place there removed the Tusker gene completely from the population. Kind of a bottleneck in its own right. <coughs> Excuse me, something <coughs> crawled into my throat. So 
So I'm no geneticist. So I can't give you very deep discussions about that. But genetics is a very important part in the makeup of all these animals. And the traits that move forward, those that are successful and those that are more dominant, generally are passed on and continue as they lead to survival. Lovely lady, you love how majestic elephants are. Indeed, they are very special animals. Always just going on about their business. Never too much of a concern. Hendrik, I don't know. I mean, these animals, their life is one of exertion and busyness. I don't foresee uh, an, one elephant working out more than another. So, of course, we see it in the human world where people take supplements to get to certain sizes. They wouldn't achieve that without certain supplements. It just it wouldn't be possible. these big muscle, these guys who push a lot of weight, there's, there's things that are needed to support that. I'm no dietitian, but I think animals go about their day and they're all very physical, they're all very strong and very tough, and their life is one of hardship, one of moving, one of sustaining resources. If we look back to hunter-gatherer humans from eons ago, they were physically fit because they moved a lot. They were physically active. They used to, to carry things, move things, catch things, physically hunt, run. This day and age life is much easier. I suppose you could say hunter-gatherers are probably very wiry people, very tough, wiry people. The same goes for animals. You don't see animals expending energy unnecessarily. So everything they do is calculated. Even a territorial dispute is all about competition <coughs> and preventing overall fighting. So territorial boundaries, although they seem to be quite dramatic and a lot of energy expended, they reduce a lot of energy in the physical confrontation. Justine, the sense of an elephant's gravity, it's hard to say, I suppose it's along the spine. Um, they've got four massive pillared legs and their head is pretty heavy. And considering their two front feet are, are larger than the back, their sense of gravity is probably a little bit towards the shoulders, I would s assume. When you see them in the water, um, because their lungs are attached to their spine, you actually see how buoyant they become, and their heads often shoot up out the water. They often have their trunks right up in the air, and that's because all of that weight is taken off with the buoyancy. So I'm assuming it's pretty much above the shoulders. Uh, I'd say that with most of our big game. The head and the shoulders lead to much larger front feet. The 
leads to that sort of center of gravity being towards the front. Uh, do you agree? Uh, yeah. Good question. Say again? Maybe she can find out. Hmm. If anybody knows um, the answer to that question, if I'm making it all up, I'm just sort of giving you my opinion. By no means do I know exactly how it works. But you see when an elephant gets up, they are lying on their side. They get up and it's always their head comes up first. They have to push their shoulders and head up into the sky. And then that enables them to get their bottom legs underneath them, their, their hind legs underneath, to then stabilize them. And when you see them in the water, they love to jump around and move around and sometimes put their legs on the back of their companions and to push that head up because of the buoyancy of the lungs. I think it must be so nice for them to shift that center of gravity when being so buoyant. scenes here. Slow down. Okay, well, I suppose a uh, discussion on anatomy there might help to answer your question. I can suggest that you can attempt to try this with me. I'm not going to do it now, but if you'd like to, you're most welcome to stick your nose into a glass of water and try a drink. It's going to be very painful, and it's going to be very uncomfortable, and you're going to splurt it out, it's going to burn you, and you're going to choke and cough. So an elephant's trunk is its, its nose. And because they are so, their mouth is so far away from the water, they have, over a very long period of time, grown into a much larger animal. That mouth was probably much closer to the ground. They were able to physically put their mouth into the water and drink like the babies do. And so over a very long time, they decided to actually use the trunk as a form of a, a collection device, a straw, if you will. That they pick up the water, hold it in the trunk, and then they pour it into the mouth. But the trunk is a nose, it is their nostrils, it's where they breathe from. So it's very, it would be very difficult to drink out of that. It's just not, just the, the, the anatomy just doesn't work. If you've ever had a, a moment of, a, of drinking when you're still speaking and you get that element of liquid going into the lungs, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. We naturally block off that part of our esophagus to prevent the lungs from getting any moisture, but every now and again, it often happens when um, when you're busy drinking and someone says something that's quite rude or gets you off guard, and often that can happen. <laughs> it's not a very pleasant feeling. Okay, well, we're going to stay here, see who else comes down to drink, and we're going to send you on down to Juma with Taylor. Drivers me by a Buffalo Sook Dam, and then he's going to come to the Rock Monitor too. Um, sorry, everyone, I was just jumping on the Game Drive radio, but a banter there. 
Um, it's obviously quite quiet on Duma this afternoon, so everyone was asking what I was doing at Buffalo Dam, and I said, watching a common green shank, and they went, woo, exciting stuff. And so I obviously, naturally as a joke, had to call in this wonderful rock monitor sighting that we're having at the moment. Um, it's panicked. It is scared. It's in the smallest bush wallow that it could possibly be, and it's climbed to the very top. I don't know where it thinks it's going to go from there. You do realize, Rock Monitor, that we don't want to eat you, and you're going to have to come climb down the tree at some point. They always make me make me laugh. These uh, these enormous lizards. Oh, it's slipping and sliding. Goodness gracious! So we're going to watch it because it could be quite entertaining if it's going to try and come downhill. Like with most things, um, you know, good at going up, but not fantastic at coming down, especially when your head is the largest part of your body. Not, not really the largest part of your body, but you know, there's a lot of weight on uh, a rock monitor's head. They've got quite a, a chunky round head, which is for me one of the easiest ways to tell the difference between a water or a Nile monitor and a rock monitor. Because even though one suggests that it spends most of its time in the water and the other one suggests it spends its, most of its time on land, you can quite easily find both of these species in the same habitat especially here in the in the Sabi sand. They are very similar and their uh, distribution quite quite often crosses over onto one another. Now it's gone onto the other side, which is quite difficult to see, but it is trying to climb down. They are equipped with really long claws though, so that'll be quite handy. <laughs> with trying to hold onto the bark, but gravity is not going to be in the favor of, uh, of this lizard. It's not the biggest, hello. Yes, it's not the biggest rock monitor we've seen. It's it's less than a meter in length, so it's still quite a young one. Not wanting to show us <laughs> its tan and disappearing into the grass. Well done, rock monitor. But um, awesome animals, though. Nice to see them uh, because it's such a, a warm day. If it's, it's natural that you're going to see a lot of movement to reptiles. I mean, we had a black mamba this morning, and then we've also now had. The rock monitor. We're on uh, a, a road not too far away from Gauri Dam, which is a great place to sit. And I hope maybe we'll even find some water monitors, and then we can quite nicely see see the difference between the two. Bye bye, rock monitor. Enjoy. Right. Next time you see us, we'll be at Gauri Dam. my fears like this.
we've got a pair of southern ground hornbills now walking down the road but they're about to disappear around the bend and in the long grass so let's go catch them oh, not not figuratively let's go and try and get a little bit closer to them before anyone thinks that i'm going to get out of the car and go Rah! although i'd never never in my entire life would i ever try and wouldn't try to catch any wildlife anyways but especially not a southern ground hornbill but i'll show you why in a moment please don't go down in into the drainage line don't do that just 30 seconds of a decent view that's all we're asking i'm i'm so shocked that the southern ground hornbills aren't so relaxed because it's the same individuals that we keep seeing except for that one day that there were five okay there they are they're hunting at the moment and you can see they're not too perturbed sometimes they'll just dash off because they'll see an insect moving but armed with those enormous beaks that can smash glass windows they do that quite often when they see their reflection not that you really see them around houses and that every um or very often but uh, there have been quite a few recorded cases where southern ground walls will walk past like a big sliding door glass sliding door and they'll see the reflection and they're very territorial and they will completely smash it they'll peck at it and that's enough to to yeah great insurance claim but um, you can see how they've got their feathers ruffled as they walk hoping that the breeze will just blow in between the feathers and try and cool them down they've also got their their beak slightly ajar obviously the gular flutter to also help with the with getting rid of some of that heat but they're on their way towards uh Gauri dam i don't think that they're going to go into the water it would be nice though imagine watching these birds have a bath that'd be cool Xavier, yes, these birds are absolutely carnivorous. They don't eat any vegetable matter at all. They eat a host of insects, though, reptiles, small mammals. They've got those beaks are so powerful, like I said, to break through glass doors, and they can also smash through the tops of tortoise shells. So, really, there's no meal too big for a southern ground hornbill. An elephant might be a bit large, but you know, in relation to their size, obviously not going to try and eat in a, an impala. Well, you never know. No, no. Well, just teasing. They probably wouldn't go for something like that. But yeah, chameleons, uh, any small uh, reptiles, so snakes, um, scrub hairs, all sorts of things. They'll literally go for anything. And and that's because most birds are very much opportunistic. Obviously, when you are a seed eater or a frugivore and you're just feeding on fruit, that's a little bit on the tricky side. Oh, you see, we're going to have to stop in that shady patch too. They're no, clever. One is racing off to try and find something else to eat and the other one is saying, no thanks, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take a moment to stretch my wings. That's exactly what it's doing. It's that hot today. Of course, I wish that I could do that and you don't have to look at the sweat patch that it's on, on my back right now from sitting up against the canvas seats. There's a... Uh, almost no there's not almost there is zero ventilation going on there and if i stand up you're probably going to see a wet patch on my bum too but thankfully that's a common thread amongst all the naturalists and camops <laughs> sitting out here you know you feel quite self-conscious when you get up but then you realize the other person's got the same thing so you're like oh well it doesn't really matter now does it um so they're just catching little bugs at the moment, but the longer that you follow the southern ground hornbills, the more you get to see. And they'll start to collect like these little shopping baskets filled with all sorts of things. So it's amazing how much they can hold in their beaks. And right at the tip, you'll see caterpillars and maybe a little snake and a grasshopper all just bundled up there. You know, unfortunately no escaping for them. I'm gonna move up the forward a little bit. Nope, nope. Yes. Okay. Jillian, surprisingly, that uh, southern ground hornbills fly fairly well. I mean, listen, they're not going to, you know, soar like a martial eagle, but they don't need to fly that high. They spend most of their time on the ground. But if they need to take off and go somewhere, they can, they can do it. So. It's not like they really, oh, we are definitely sitting in this shady spot. This is so nice. Bird, I feel you. If you want to come back here and join us, no problem. There's more than enough shade here. So, so yeah, so they do fly fairly well. And they, again, they're not going to be able to travel huge distances. 
um, but if they need to fly over a big open area and maybe a little bit further they can definitely do so. What I have noticed about them is that they're much better at landing in trees than some of the eagle species. We actually briefly saw the Marshall e Eagle right at the beginning of drive and it was sitting out on a dead tree in the hot sun and I just thought shame that's terrible but you know they've got such a big wingspan that they really do struggle to land in some of these um, trees. Again, they're not going to be able to land in a tree that's got lots of scrappy branches, you know, covered in leaves. That's going to be a bit tricky. But if you look straight ahead of us, there's a big marula tree uh, in the road, actually where that one is walking. And you can see how those sort of horizontal branches stretch out. That's perfect. That bird can very easily from that point on the ground fly and land in the tree with no problem. We watch vultures land in tree and they're absolutely hopeless. They break branches, they almost fall out of them. So I, I do think that they've got a lot more control than some of the other birds. But again, they don't really have the abilities to fly incredible heights and then soar for long periods of time. But um, when when all your food is on the ground, you don't really you don't really need those capabilities. I've even seen them scavenging on carcasses before. So they'll go and peck at. Um, I've seen them both eating, you know, beetles and maggots that are around carcasses. But then I've also seen them pulling off small chunks of flesh too. But again, they eat they eat small mammals. Nature doesn't really say no to anything. If it's there and they're hungry, they're going to eat it. They can't really afford to be fussy. And it's just something like a pangolin and an aardvark, or even an aardvore thing, then that's a bit on the tricky side. Then your diet is very restricted to ants and termites. Okay, let's try catch them again. I hope they, I hope they walk over the damn wall. That'll be nice. No. No. Yes. No. Silly me, I didn't use the magic word. I'm such a ditzy blonde. Anyways, <laughs> we should get a, a better view of them now. Obviously, this road kind of goes around the bend over here and then it drops down and then comes back up, and then we'll be on top of the damn wall. Who was that question from? Cam. Cam. Cam, sorry. Ah, look there. See? No, sorry. I'm so sorry. I thought that only I didn't see the other one. I got a fright. I got a fright too. And they are walking over the dam wall. I think it was the question was from Cam about what is the southern ground hornbill's closest relative? I don't know, the Abyssinian hornbill? I don't know. Um the Abyssinian ground hornbill. I well, I suppose the hornbill family, I'm assuming. That, you know, we see all the other species of hornbill, you know, that they must be their closest relatives. I, I don't actually, I don't actually know. I mean, if, honestly, if we're talking prehistoric creatures, I'm going to go with a velociraptor, potentially. No, not a velociraptor, because I don't think velociraptors were really that carnivorous, were they? They were, they were made out to be very different species on Jurassic Park. But maybe like a small, ferocious dinosaur. I don't know. But yeah, because they're, they're quite in. No. No. There we go. Uh, so hopefully, um, not hopefully. So yes. One is flying now, a short distance. Shh. I also decided I'm not calling Sparky Sparky anymore. Its new name is Lemon. No, don't. You don't need to run. I'm creeping. No. They're also really good runners, as you can see. They move quite quickly. I wonder if they, who would win in a race if you had to put a roadrunner and a southern ground hornbill. Although when they start to run, it's amazing how their wings all of a sudden, they start to extend from their body and then they, then they naturally just take off and then fly. So they're really good at flying quite low to the ground, which I think is impressive. And now they're going to go onto the next open area where there will be impalas and all sorts of other animals. So um, not that they're going to be bothering one another. The impalas are actually right now, you can see a couple of them are watching. Watching their uh, hornbills sort of move across the dam wall. I wonder what the antelope species sort of think of them. Probably get quite annoyed with them first thing in the morning when they start calling. They're very vocal. 
I, however, appreciate the sound. I think it's quite nice. Like drums, and I normally listen to music in the morning, so I can do a little dancey dance when the horn will start calling. Okay, yeah. we shall continue following them and then look at all the other things. We might just give, no, we might give uh, the dam a skip for now, but we can always come back later. Also, I've realized that I've unintentionally done a bird drive this afternoon. I never do those on purpose, but uh, I will take what I'm given. Like I said, most, most days I go out with absolutely no plan at all and I just take what I can get, whether it's a squirrel, a tortoise, an insect, you know, I, I would absolutely love to have an adrenaline packed filled wild dog sighting or leopards, but, but we can't force it because nothing is happening right now. Right, anyways, we're going to find a nice tree to sit under and continue to watch Southern Ground Hornbills. Off we go across to Chris and with the temperatures uh, at what they are today, hopefully you'll be watching some elephants. Our patients have definitely paying off here at Mblobu Dam. Just look at the size of this herd of elephants, lots of babies. And in fact, a number of them have moved off already. And it seems like as one group moves off, another group moves in. And there's a few of them that at the water now there's a tiny little baby amongst them as well cough a couple of babies here and we've got that's tiny hey that is very 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 small Actually, this is only about a third of the elephants that was here just now but like i said you know it's almost as if the bush is creating them on the northern side. They just keep on moving in and out and in and out. There's a couple of them standing in front of us, literally in the shade, including that big cow that we saw earlier. Lots of things happening. It's like you don't know where to look. There are youngsters playing. There's a Cough, trying to figure out how to use its trunk <laughs> in order to dust himself. And there's more elephants coming over the dam wall. This is incredible. Definitely a hot spot for elephants at the moment. And why not on a hot day just sit at the water hole and let the things come to you you know hi there bexy yeah, bexy's got a lovely comment there saying wow chris patience definitely pays off and this is stunning thanks bexy it is fantastic isn't it and the fact that they are so calm with all these babies makes it even better you know uh, and that's because they approached us. They saw us here. Okay, there's a vehicle. All right, we're not right at the edge of the water, so we're not interfering with their drinking. We're at a distance. And they naturally, some of them actually came up to the vehicle just now. And it looks like they might have one last little drink and they're probably going to then start moving off. I mean, they are, after all, elephants and they need to consume vast quantities of plant matter. There's a whole bunch of them behind the trees that we can't even see. But I did a brief count just before the feed was sent to us now, uh, or the transmission, what do you want to call it? Uh, I counted roughly again about 80 elephants at one spot. Yeah. Uh, it's very likely that big herd that we saw yesterday as well more or less at the same time it seems to be ooh, somebody's chasing somebody there how come such a young bull not chasing such a big cow don't take his nonsense you're a mature cow
They're after that lovely sweet water that comes out of the trough that we pump here. And that, some of the bulls become very possessive over that lovely sweet water that they... I mean, I'm actually drinking some of that water right now. And it's one of the reasons why we've put in this borehole, because the previous borer where we fetched very, very high mineral content, it was not the greatest of water. Fine for the animals, but for us it's not the greatest. So eco training's done a, a new borehole close to camp, right along this drainage line, or this little small seasonal small ravine that comes past here. And um, that water is, is it's, 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 it's been tested, it's fantastic, it, it's like, it tastes like water from the shelf, you know, it's, it's, and it's, I mean, if it's, if it's good water for us to drink, it just makes sense that the animals will also love it. And that's partially one of the reasons why in Glover Dam, the dam which you see now, is so popular with elephants at the moment. And again, for those who've just recently joined us, Ndlovu Dam is a dam in the central parts of Brightlands. I don't know. I'm unable to show you on a map now, but Brightlands, the shape of our area that we have access to is very square. And Ndlovu Dam is right smack in the middle of our traversing area. almost almost right in the middle in the center We have a question from Misty. Misty wants to know, are the majority of animal adaptations there for successful mating? Um, Misty, a lot of the adaptations are geared towards, not I won't say mating, but propagating the genetic material. If you look at the way dominance is established in males, especially, mostly. Um, yes, so the physical features are often geared towards, I don't know, directly mating, but in order to reproduce. And that links to food, it links to be able to be healthy, and able to be, to be competitive with other males if you're a male. It needs to be uh, you know, adaptations could be related to food and water and everything, but ultimately all of that is geared to make the species reproduce. An unhealthy elephant cow will be unlikely to reproduce, so animals live to exist. And the way a species exists is for it to reproduce and to reproduce in the right way meaning the fittest and the healthiest are the ones that are going to reproduce. So a lot of the adaptations, even something like a trunk or an ear or cooling themselves down or be able to find water, dig for food, being able to hunt like a lion. Yes, it's food provision initially, but everything eventually sort of channels towards the overarching sort of, if I can, if I can put it like, they want to exist as a species and a major part of that is to be able to reproduce you cannot reproduce if you're not healthy and then it branches from there males cannot reproduce if they're not dominant uh, if, or establish mating rights depending on the species you know that there's, there's, there's a lot of variance in that theme there I'm just generalizing now but this is rather Rather spectacular, I must say. Look at that. I 
and now we have a bit of a breeze coming up. Very welcome, I must say, because it does bring a bit of a relief on this very, very hot day. Very hot day today. Possibly explaining why elephants are frequenting the water hole. Quench their thirst, get some water going in their bodies, hydration. And obviously to help cool them down. I've seen a few of them splash themselves with water, especially in and around the ears. You'll probably find on a very hot day, some will even enter the water and submerge themselves if it's very, very, very hot. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone is having a brilliant Tuesday. Of course, we are on the awesome Juma Dam Cam with the help of our awesome Zoomies. We're just trying to figure out where the southern ground hornbills are because they have not, or it has not yet reappeared yet again. Hopefully, it comes back out. But my name is Lisa, I am the waterhole naturalist and of course observing our different dam cams, making sure that uh, I get to tell all of you if there are any spectacular sightings at the different waterholes that we have. But as you can see some impala still around as we saw earlier this afternoon as well. And we're just trying to stay like this just for in case the hornbills pop out somewhere. Just give me a second. I just want to see if we can hopefully spot them. Hopefully, ooh, is that them? I do see some black specks in the background moving. Of course, you are now hiding in the grass, you silly birds. But it is always such a treat, as Taylor said, to see these beauties. Of course, we know they are endangered. And if you don't know, these are the southern ground hornbills. The little bit of movement you can see in the grass, that is them. <laughs> now you'll see two massive black birds with some red on their faces. And of course now we see nothing, these animals. However, it is a good thing to maneuver around in the grass like this. A lot of potential for a lot of insects and creepy crawlies. And of course some snakes or even lizards.
Jennifer, good afternoon and thank you so much for getting in touch with us. <laughs> you would like to know if they would beat their prey to death. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, not necessarily like a secretary bird. Um, for the most part, they use their beaks. I've seen a video of a juvenile southern ground hornbill swallowing a snake and it actually choked on the snake like for a minute it passed out and all of that instead of just making some sushi but yes of course they will use whatever they need to if the prey is being a little bit difficult <laughs> but they can definitely beat them to death as you say yes but not necessarily in the way that you might be thinking of a secretary bird. I don't know if that's perhaps why you're asking. But they are very vicious birds. Not something you do want to mess with. Woo! You can just hear the buffalo weavers right above us. Vivian, good afternoon. You would like to know if birds sweat, I think was your question. <laughs> I don't know if MC can just confirm for us. Yes. <laughs> so, no. The thing with birds is they do a lot of, they go through a lot of forms and processes of bathing course you know they will actually bathe in water to cool off to preen themselves etc but often you will see birds opening their beaks or their bills and that is essentially like a dog panting as well you know trying to exert some heat or extra heat I, I should say but as I say they do bathe as well in water they take dust baths but that is more to actually preen their beautiful feathers And then birds also go through something what we call anting. It's really, really fascinating to actually see it. I've only seen it a couple of times. So you get passive anting, which is... Ooh, what did we hear? All of these bookies are now very alert. Uh, sorry, so just to get back to the anting, when birds ant, they actually, you get passive anting, which is a bird just lying in the soil and waiting for ants to get all over it. And of course, in the process, actually cleaning it. And then you also get active anting, when a bird actually physically picks up an ant and put it, puts it on its body and uh, allows it to preen the bird. Animal lover, you would like to know what my favorite hornbill is. So I really am fond of the southern ground hornbill, particularly because they are endangered and it is super cool to see them. And then also another hornbill is one I have not yet seen, which is the trumpeter hornbill. And I am yet to see one for myself. I do apologize, our damn cam controls are not wonderful. I'm just trying to get back to the hornbills. Someone is excited. <laughs> I can't tell you who that was or what it was for. Hopefully they saw the hornbills and you know they got super excited for seeing an endangered bird species. <laughs> I know that's definitely how I felt when Taylor found them.
Come on, birdies. I'm just trying to catch up with him. My apologies. Just bear with me. Hmm. All right. I'm going to hand back over to our zoomies so they can try and find these beautiful birdies so long. But in the meantime, let's see what's happening at the beautiful Ukukuyo. No, wait for me. It's our banded mongoose. And I apologize for the fence. As you know, here at Okakweo, of course, just behind the camera is a beautiful resort or camping site that you can actually visit. Oh, man, I've been looking for these guys the whole day. And, of course, now they disappear. That's all right. No one wants to stay with me. It's perfectly fine. I shall find something else. Lapwing, go, go, Lapwing, go. <laughs> and as always, what would a day be without me showing you that all of the Egyptian goslings are still safe and sound? I'm just trying to get you the perfect view to show you all of the little ones. Ugh, of course, it's difficult to see. So, on our left, we've got Harry, and to our right, we've got Sally. And then I'm still deciding on names for the goslings. You are more than welcome to send through your suggestions. And then off to our right, the blacksmith lapwing. That is actually their godmother. I haven't figured out what her name is yet. <laughs> But I will continue doing so, and I'm waiting for your suggestions for six Egyptian goslings in Namibia. And so while I also think of some names for the little ones, I'm going to send you to Chris in Pridelands. Amazing that after all that action, and numbers of elephants. Now there's virtually peace here at the dam now. And just one single young elephant toddler still lingering around. A young bull. Most of them have now moved off in various directions. So that suggests that it wasn't nest. It was multiple herds that just happened to be at the water hole kind of like at the same time. And that's the thing about observing. Oh, there's another bull coming in now. Young bull. These are teenagers. They're teenagers. They're young boys. I'm going to quickly greet each other. Obviously seen there's another elephant inbound. Slightly older guy, 
but not by much. Clearly see higher ranking, slightly bigger. He's going to first dips at the sweet water, at the area where it is emerging from where we're pumping it. It's empty, boy. There's nothing in there. We've switched it off now. It's pumping to the camp now. Because soon we will lose sun and the pump runs on a solar panel. So we need to make sure that we have water in camp. <laughs> he seems very disgusted. He has to go back to the actual water in the dam. That's the same water. You can drink that. Don't be fussy. You can always go to Leopard Dam, which is far from here. So you're going to be very thirsty by the time you arrive there, and then there's only mud. I don't think that's going to be something you would enjoy. So just enjoy the water. This is good water to drink. It's good, clean water. Hi there, animal lover says it's such a huge animal that brings such tranquility to a sighting. And animal lover elephants do that. You know, when, you know, think about uh, old Beagle Zawini when he's around and we have him like around, you know, there's a certain peace in, in elephants. They are peaceful creatures, in fact. It's when you mess around with them when they become not peaceful and angry and annoyed with us and that's when the trouble starts if you give them the necessary respect and space yes you do have individuals that at times can cause a bit of trouble much like us they are beings that have a very high self-awareness emotional sort of awareness emotional capacity a very intelligent creature so there's going to be bound to be variance in behavior when it comes to emotions much like us some people are introverts and some people are extroverts some people like to be in the limelight and some people don't and elephants are exactly the same in that respect in my opinion There's another small young bull coming in now. But young to be away from the herd. And at least he's got two older. Could be friends, it could be family members, it could be cousins. Could even be an older brother, you never know. I think this guy's going to come investigate us a little bit. Ears are open, so he's obviously wary of us. That in its own is not aggression. But it's typically a sign that it's wary of us. In the case of a young bull, I'm not too worried about it. I don't think he'll react in any funny manner towards us. Nancy wants to know what has been my best elephant sighting nancy there are just i'm mean, too many to to try and mention i've had so many over the years uh one in particular i can recall i was doing a walk safari in eastern kruger along the nonetsi river which is in the far central east of the kruger park quite far from here and there was this big 
Donga. Now, Donga is this empty, sort of deep, sort of gully that's formed by erosion, which is about two meters wide and about two meters deep. And we were on the one side of this Donga or gully, and on the other side, we saw a massive elephant bull with one tusk. But if I say massive, tusk size, I'm talking is a weenie territory. Big, big tusker. He saw us and I told my, my safari guest, listen, we will just remain on the bank of this gully. There's a deep two meter donga between us. Elephant's not gonna cross it. We just went down, sat flat and watched this elephant pass us. And as he was coming past us, now remember, he was about two and a half meters from us, but there's no physical way to get to us. Well, and he was just not really interested, stopped, looked at us a little bit, very, probably stand, stood, and then continued. That was an amazing sighting. And we were on foot. That was, that was amazing. It was such an incredible experience. But there's a lot of elephant sightings I have probably forgotten probably the bulk of them already. So remember, it's a daily occurrence for us. Um, so the brain is getting a bit rusty. getting some of the mud around there that's been and as the, the elephants have moved through it's a lot of sludge there at the edge of the water hole and this guy's just making sure he gets a good mud cover will help cool him down Join us from the 23rd till the 27th of January for a week of back-to-school special safaris tailored specifically towards our future conservationists. Our naturalists will exclusively be taking questions from schools across the globe. Tune in for some entertaining animal education to ease you back into the school year because fostering the upcoming generations of conservationists matters. Welcome back to Tlo Dam here in the sort of western parts 
west and central parts of Madikwe, where we've just had over a hundred elephants walk past us. Everything was very calm for a moment, and then, well, as you know, some boys got involved, and then 80 or so of those elephants, maybe less, all went screaming away, away from us. It was all a little bit something. Now here we are with the calm section of the herd that remained behind, having their nice afternoon casual drink. Splendid time to just be quiet for a moment, to just enjoy these beautiful scenes. Cindy D, you'll know if they're upset. They will show you. Their behavior will change. If they're very upset, they actually scream and trumpet. But that screaming and trumpet can also be something other than being upset. Their body language will change. A grumpy elephant is generally quite an irritated elephant. They shake their head a lot. They make a lot of noise. It's best to be aware. Sorry about the pole, everybody. It seems like one herd is going to pass us on the left. And then we're going to get the remainder of them in a moment passing by us in front. We've had this moment to ourselves here, splendid moment here on the low-lying areas off of the dam wall and seems like we've picked our position perfectly around. Let's get back to these guys here, they're all going to walk past us. Now Cindy D, Cindy B, apologies if I got that wrong, you see all these elephants here, they're walking quite casually, um, elephants that are a little bit worked up, they walk quite fast. It's almost like that like fast jogging motion. There's nothing calm about them. Um, they bunch together and uh, they might shake their head and they might be trumpeting that takes place. So we're seeing very calm elephants here. An elephant also that's a little bit upset would have its head raised quite high. If you've ever walked into the library to hand in that library book and uh, it's come in a bit late and <laughs> they look at you down the end of their nose, then you know that feeling when you feel like you're in a little bit of trouble. So everybody, on the 23rd to the 27th of January, Wild Earth are going to be doing back to school. And we are looking for schools to partake in this. So we're inviting classes from schools worldwide to join us for the first hour of the Sunset Safari on any day of that week. If you are a teacher or know of any teachers, please head to wildearth.tv forward slash kids to book your class on a virtual safari in Africa. There are only a few slots available, so get your bookings going. And on that note, I'm just going to just be quiet and allow you to just enjoy this with us.
Verula Shortcake. What a, what a fascinating name. It is indeed amazing to be immersed in nature like this. We are truly blessed. The elephant energy, the elephant medicine. from the herd, the big bull, doesn't need to deal with all the dramas that take place within the pushing and shoving of the breeding herd. Apologies for the pole. Thunder, th the mud is there, and they might rub it off with their trunk, but uh, there's not much to be done about it. Not much to be done about the mud if they get it all over their face, it just remains there. Possibly you could spray some water on it later if it becomes a bit irritating. Now let me move over here, lost all those elephants, but we've got a couple more, oh, have you still got those two? Okay, let's see if these two boys are going to interact behind the bushes. Always happens behind the bushes. If I move we're going to be shooting into the sun there, we do still have some, oh, no we can't go there. <laughs> we'll make do with these guys over here. So slowly move on. What a splendid sighting. I count myself very blessed, Rian, I'm sure you do as well. What a magical moment. Very nice. We're still birding, because that's the only thing we seem to be able to find, so I'm very reluctantly showing our Egyptian geese. The Egyptian geese, where are your goslings? I haven't actually seen any goslings for the pair that live at a tree house dam. Now, if you're wondering why I'm bashing the Egyptian geese slightly, is because I think I have said everything that I know about an Egyptian goose about 300,000 times. So I haven't found a new study that they're doing on them yet. But when they do, best you believe that's what you'll be hearing. I Google it quite regularly <laughs> looking for something. If somebody has anything new to add about Egyptian geese, maybe I've missed that there's a new study that's, uh, that's happening. <gasps> Paul, do you see the terrapin that's erupting out of the water? I think it's a terrapin just behind them. Do you see it looks like a rock? Are they mating terrapins? Where's my binoculars? Yeah. Go keep going. There. 
They are. Look at that. I have never in my entire life seen mating terrapins. That's quite interesting. I suppose it's, uh, I mean, we see tortoises mating all the time. We hear them normally before we see them. But obviously with terrapins being in the water, I didn't even think about that. I don't think I've ever been asked the questions. How, or not how, where do terrapins mate on land or in the water? I wouldn't have been able to have answered that question, honestly, uh, until today. Now I can quite comfortably say, in the water. That was quite cool, actually. There we go, never mind. So I haven't learned anything new about the Egyptian geese yet, but now I've clearly expanded my knowledge on terrapins, but now they're gone. We'll keep an eye out in case the a head pops out, two heads pop out at the same time. But a blacksmith lapwing has now also joined the party, and uh, a few moments ago there was even a um, emerald spotted wood, not, it wasn't an emerald spotted wood dove, it was a laughing dove, but it's flown away now. So we've just got those four birds and uh, yeah, we, we, we're keeping an eye out for, for anything else that might want to come and show itself. Of course, what would a safari be without, or a summer safari, without the call of the woodland kingfisher? I'm not quite sure what's in the water, but the blacksmith lapwings just to the left also just mated. Unless they were... Unless they were, they, I don't know if you can see them, just a little bit to the left by the log. There we go. There they two are. So they, the male just jumped on top of the female. I can't tell you which one is which. Though. They look almost identical. Now they're just pretending that they weren't doing anything. Okay, Egyptian geese, you're next up. No pressure. Of course, that's not going to happen because now I'm, I'm asking for it. But things always happen in threes, don't they? I'm still keeping an eye out on the water as well for the terrapin because that was that was fascinating. I'd like to kind of see it again. It seemed to be a lot quicker than what happens with tortoises. But I suppose it's a little bit difficult in the in the water. I imagine. Anyways, um, Egyptian geese now. One is going. What are you eating? Are you grazing? As they usually do. No. Oh, they are. They're pulling out very fine pieces of grass. It almost looks like they're not eating anything. But the vegetation that they're feeding on is just tiny, very, very thin strands. Victoria, sorry, there was a, had a glitch in my brain for a second. You asked a question about how do birds regulate their temperatures. So, um, very similar to the way that mammals do. That's how they, of course, uh, regulate the temperatures. We might have an argument between the blacksmith lapwing. Look how it's lowered its head. Not happy with the Egyptian goose. Egyptian goose does not care. Oh, it's surrounded. Two blacksmith versus one Egyptian goose. Who's going to win? I think I'm going to bet on the blacksmith lapwings. Although, oh, stalking. I don't know, I've never seen a blacksmith lapwing stalk another bird either. What are you going to do when you get closer? Are you going to peck its tail feathers or are you just going to e escort it off your lawn? Interesting. So, sorry, Victoria. Yeah, so there's um, obviously with reptiles, they are ectothermic, so they need to regulate their temperature by absorbing heat direct sunlight or absorbing heat from a rock or the sand or some kind of external object that might be retaining heat but with birds they are able to regulate their temperatures normally something that birds do struggle with though and i've spoken about it a couple of times is at night time so during the day they're fine um but especially on those oh, i suppose if you have snow conditions i don't know i suppose in the birds that living in snow conditions must have I don't know, extra down feathers to try and combat that. But at night time, um, birds that will perch in trees and on the very cold night, they need to be very careful about moving around too much. So if they don't hold 
their their position and they get disturbed and they have to fly another distance i always like to describe it as you know what it feels like when it's freezing cold but you need to get up and uh, run to the bathroom and you have to leave your very warm blanket and you you know obviously go do everything as quick as you can and you dive back underneath the covers but you're still freezing and it takes a little bit of time to regenerate the warmth and now birds aren't able to do that as well and that's quite often when they can die of cold shock and um and you'll find just a, a bird that's dead underneath a tree and you're kind of like what happened and i think that i mean it's not similar with reptiles but i know that there was um was it in florida with all the iguanas recently i've been seeing a lot of videos of iguanas basically falling out of trees because of uh, the weather patterns at the moment and and they were just so cold that they didn't quite know what to do with themselves and because there's obviously they can't generate any warmth they're just l losing all of their energy and and toppling out of trees which is actually quite sad but i did see a few kind humans moving around and picking them up and wrapping them in towels just to try and help them and and, and sort of taking them taking them in until the uh, storm brews over but um yeah so that that's an issue sort of for birds even though they have got those those nice warm feathers um it, it's yeah it's, it can be quite tricky for them sometimes woodland kingfisher can you not and the ring neck dove well at least they both i was going to say at least they both listened and then the woodland kingfisher carried on how exciting not much though at treehouse dam we're really scraping the bottle bottom of the barrel hoping that a herd of 150 buffalo will come down and drink but i doubt that that's going to happen right chitwa not chitwa <laughs> tess is off down at chitwa and um, bumbling about there let's go see what she's looking at Probably sounds a bit strange, but it is my first time ever seeing a green-backed heron in a nest. Ever. I come past here often and wonder what has been using this nest in the middle of Chitwa Dam. It looks like it should be a hummercorp nest. They build these messy stick nests with a chamber inside, a whole entrance to the side, flat on the top. But I've never seen a hummercorp here. And this is pretty out of the norm for a green bacterium so i think it's just recycling somebody else's nest and we've seen both of them go in and come back out from that particular nest and you can see one sitting in the entrance at the moment so first time for green bacterians in a nest and first time for me to see them recycling somebody else's nest that's not the usual shape they go for ordinarily you would find green bacterians one has actually just flown over to us. You'd find green back herons build a stick platform nest that's kind of shallow on the top and they nest on the top of it. They don't, just like other herons, they don't usually build these kind of whole nests. And so to see this one having flown out and come over here and potentially just get some sun, but also maybe looking for some food, I have to wonder, is it going to take some food back to the nest? just amazing it is the normal breeding season now it's the normal laying dates are anywhere from September right the way through to about February but I just never thought that I'd actually see them nesting here and particularly not where they are so this heron and its partner have really surprised me today I got really excited as we drove past and I saw a little bird pop up in that hole only to look and realize it was this one. How special. Wow, did you see how it stretched its neck down? Looks like it's got something right at the tip of its beak. Oh, 
whatever it was, it's gone. Did you see that eagle? It looked like a little, like a tiny little speck of something. As though it was a very, very, very baby fish. But it might just be me. <laughs> it very well could also be my eyes. Could be the eyes or the brain, either way. Wow, look at that beautiful bird. Very distinctive looking bird, used to be known as the striated heron. Now it is purely the green backed heron. For obvious reasons, it's got a very grey emerald mix on the top of the head and down the back. And I have to wonder if we're going to be seeing tiny little baby, 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 baby here and soon, because I have never seen that. So if we got to see, if we got to see baby herons, I think I would absolutely fall in love straight away. And it would definitely be a first. Have you ever seen baby herons, Eagle? No? So they are known to be monogamous. And they normally nest oh, over the water. There it goes. <laughs> Bronwyn, that length of the neck was absolutely insane. It stretched so far down into the water. It was quite impressive. <laughs> I've not seen one use that hunting strategy before. <laughs> normally they just wade along the edges. I don't know where it's gone though. That's okay. We've got a hippo that's popped up to say hi. And if we do happen to see the other heron, we'll let you know. Hello, hippo. It has cooled down so beautifully. I think the hippos are going to start getting active. I'm not sure why this one is separated from the rest of the family. It's all over on the one side of the dam. The others are all either at the top or the, the opposite end. And so I suppose this one just wanted a bit of quiet time. It is possible that it's due to some of the... Oh, hello, ox picker. Due to some of the social dynamics within the pod. The family will have probably multiple males and a lot more females than males. But the young males do get kicked out by the older males. The females have a bit of a hierarchy. Maybe this one isn't as favoured as some of the others. But at least the red-billed ox pickers come over to make friends. And of course use the hippo as a lovely perch to get some water from a safe spot. might have to reposition my vehicle so I am currently blocking the damn wall and we have got another vehicle that's come in <laughs> no worries at all how are you very well thank you very good thank you you are some lovely birding we are <laughs> see you later <laughs> Always nice to stop and chat, don't you think? Okay. So we're covering up for the sun, hence the kickoys. But it's now cooling off enough and there's some shade building up from the dam wall. How beautiful is it here? I feel like the dam is never disappointing. Just like Taylor had those interactions with the Egyptian geese and the blacksmith lapwings, there are just so many birds here. I think if we were to focus, you know, and move around the edge of the dam bit by bit, we would see so many interesting interactions happening all the time. Probably the most active at the moment are these water thickenings. And of course the hippos. It's 
Just have a listen for a little bit. Just the most beautiful sounds of those water thickenies in particular and occasionally the hippos joining in. But I feel very lucky. I'm happy that I spotted that little nest and I think we're going to keep an eye on it over the coming weeks and hope for some babies. Here at Wild Earth, we take great pride in curating our best animal content for you. Would you like our very best animal stories, highlights, questions, and the inside scoop on all things Wild Earth before anyone else? Find it all, as well as info on our exciting plans going forward first, in the newsletter handmade just for you. Available to all Wild Earth explorers. We've repositioned a smidge again to come and find the other main part of the pod of hippos. And we have a little surprise for you. I'm hoping that you're going to see it soon, soon, soon because... Sorry about that, we'll get you back to Tessa in just a bit, our apologies. And I have been <laughs> patiently waiting for some lions. In the 10 seconds you left me, no update yet. <laughs> but hopefully something comes along. And these beautiful birds you see flying overhead, those are pearl-breasted swallows. For the most part, generally they are quite common in areas such as Okokoyo, as well as Juma, Mashatu. It's a fairly common bird species. But how insane is this sunset this afternoon and I know I say that every single time but <laughs> it really just gets better each and every single day
I'm going to try my luck once again with a banded mongoose. However, I do not think that we'll get lucky. I do not see them often on this damn camp, but when I do, generally they are close to camp and then they sort of scurry into the camp. Probably looking for some goodies that they can find. <laughs> not seem like it but just look at this imagine you are sitting in this campsite chilling on a chair and seeing absolutely everything that comes past I actually personally have not been to this location myself my mom went in I keep wanting to say last year <laughs> the year before last year which was 2021 kind of reminder <laughs> And she literally could not stop ranting and raving about this beautiful location. If you've been here, please let me know. It is definitely on my list for this year to visit. And I will, of course, let you know about my travels and experience here and all of that. But for now, I'm just so, so, so fortunate and lucky to be able just to be monitoring the beautiful sunset, the animals, and everything that goes on around this beautiful waterhole. Alrighty, we are going to try this again. <laughs> I'm going to send you over to Tessa, who apparently has a surprise for us. The best surprise of all kind, and Lisa, let me tell you, you would be jealous right now. I'm sure you are, because it's not just a hippo. Right now it is. Wait, it's coming. <laughs> Wait for it. There it is. Oh, hello, baby. <laughs> the cutest little newborn hippo I've seen in a very long time. Full flashbacks of Rolo and Polo playing in the dam, climbing all over mom's back. Being the cutest little baby of all time. And now that it's getting cool, it started playing. So mom is being incredibly tolerant. Ah, oh, do we have to move again? Oh no. Mom is being incredibly tolerant. And letting this little one climb all over her as they do. I'm just going to pull us a little, little bit forward because the dam wall is quite narrow. So I don't want anybody to miss any action because we're in the way. I will reverse for you, Igor. That should be enough space. That should do it. That should do it. Oh! little baby so it's always the most fun when there's tiny baby hippos that pop up in the family of hippos oh look at it it's amazing hello hello <laughs> vehicle stop into chat bye Jordan <laughs> oh Wow, look at the little teeth. Well, that's actually a fairly big hippo. It's not a big male, so she doesn't have huge tusks, but she's got fairly small teeth for a mama. Let's hope the baby will follow suit because mammals particularly learn by copying. Is she gonna try and jump on the back? Yes, I'm saying she, sorry. I don't actually know if it's a male or female. It might be intrigued by the ox picker. How did you get up there? <laughs> so remember these little hippos are so small that they have to bounce off the bottom to come up to breathe. So what this little one has to do, there's a jump. What it has to do is try its best to bounce off the bottom and onto mom's back so that it can stay out of the water, both to stay warm in the sun, but also so it doesn't get exhausted from trying to breathe. She's pushing it towards shallower water now. 
so it's not having to tread water. Oh, Tams and I agree. This baby is amazingly adorable. Hippo calves are so cute. And I know we were talking about it yesterday, about what, what it is that makes them so cute. And I spoke about the tiny ears. And what I didn't mention is when they do have these tiny little yawns, you can see little, little, little teeth breaking out. I'm hoping we get to see that today. But my favorite is how clumsy they are when they're trying to climb onto mom's back. And when they're playing. So I'm hoping this little one gives us at least some of that. I don't know how old this little one is, but I haven't seen it here before. That being said, it has been rather windy at the dam, so you'd probably find she had it in a little sheltered corner somewhere. They keep the little one separated for a week to two weeks before they integrate it with the rest of the family. And there are other hippos that have been close by, so at least we know that this little one is, it's probably less than a month old, but I don't think that it's less than a week old, if that makes sense. That little ox picker that's just popped up at the bottom out of the blue on the log. <laughs> it's very unhappy that the hippos keep going back underwater because the, the perch of the log isn't as safe as the hippos. Francine, it's unlikely for hippos to pick up ticks in the water. It's more likely that they'll pick them up when they're out in the grass because they're grazers. So at night they come out and feed on the grass, walk through some pretty thick areas. And so that's probably where they pick up the ticks because the ticks like to stay right at the tops of the grasses, almost in the inflorescences. And then as animals walk past, they attach to the fur or the nose or any bare patch of skin that they can find and then will bite into the animal and stay there for as long as they possibly can. So in the water, as much as the ticks can survive in water, they're probably not the strongest swimmers. And it would be more difficult to get close to something like a hippo unless it was sitting very still. So you'd probably find majority would be out of the water. Also remember in the water, things like terrapins will be feeding on them. Fish as well will try and feed on them. Even amphibians, things like little frogs would try and feed on ticks in the water. So it's safer for ticks out of the water than in the water. But that is at least, you know, speaking of that, it is a bonus for the hippos to be in the water if they do have ticks because then the terrapins might help to clean them. I don't know if you've ever seen particularly rhinos or warthogs lying in water. Warthogs are a bit more skittish, but rhinos, if they lie in water, they actually lie down for long enough that the terrapins come up to the side and start eating ticks off of them as well. So any chance they get, terrapins will be there doing a little bit of pest control. For them, it's just breakfast, lunch or dinner, but in the bigger reality of things, it's a great method of pest control. Oh, this little one is so cute. So it would have been born about the size of its mum's head not submerged like that, but the head out of the water. It would have been born about the size of her head. So it's already done pretty well. They do grow quite quickly. Because they're in the water, they can play a lot more. It is a bit safer, and so they are capable of growing pretty fast. And they learn very quickly how to navigate in an underwater and on land world. They, they do a bit of both. just so cute. I'm really hoping we get to see it come out of the water again just now and play or try and jump onto mom's back.
says, right you are. I'm super, super jealous. I want that baby hippo in my pocket. It's like a little pocket-sized hippo. It is adorable. And it is always just so, so, so incredible to see new life. Whether it's hippos, lions, elephants, lapwings, Egyptian geese. Really anything out here is so spectacular when we get to witness it. And especially when we get to witness the offspring of them. taking a little bath <laughs> it's always so cool today we actually it wasn't live on escape to nature but one of our zoomies caught some ox pickers taking taking a bath on the island in gauri dam and that was pretty cool to see it's not something you see too often i think it was a good eight or nine ox pickers if i'm not mistaken so it's always so cool you know to see birds bathing and preening and doing all of these interesting things and even if they are doing nothing they still remain so so special Speaking of new life, look at the grass coming through. It seems silly, but I'm very excited for the rain. <laughs> I think it truly is going to do wonders for Okokoyo. We are still hoping we are going to have a little bit of action from this tiny baby hippo but I thought while we wait for the action to come to us it's a good time for us to do a quiz. I think that's a good idea. So I'm going to ask you some questions and you can send in some answers and then I'll go over some of them just now and see if anybody managed to get them right because hippos are a bit of an anomaly. They're, they're a strange animal, they're very different to all the other animals out here and so there's a lot of different things about them. But I think probably the first question and the best question to ask is which family of animals is the hippo's closest relative? I think that's a good one. So if you think you know which family it is that is a hippo's closest relative, please do let me know. I'm excited to hear any answers you have. And the second one is how much a baby hippo weighs when it's born. I'm not talking a pygmy hippo, I'm talking the actual hippopotamus like you see in front of you. This little thing, how much did it weigh when it was born maybe a few weeks ago? Oh, sorry, the wind is picking up. Let me try and hide my hat. Oh no. Whew. That's probably a bit better. It's dying down a bit now. Better. Thank you. And the third one, which will be my final question, if you want to answer all three, that would be incredible. Do you know the name of the acid that hippos have? in their milk and in what we think looks like sweat but isn't actually sweat that makes it that kind of pinkish red color i'm just going to chat on the radio negative she went mobile uh, from the dam wall towards charles kaya Oh, I'm excited. 
excited to hear some answers. <laughs> I think there's answers coming in. This is exciting. Hippos are so fascinating. I think because, because they look different, because their lifestyle is so different, they've got some pretty strange adaptations that other mammals don't have, like the way that we perceive them to sweat. They don't actually have sweat glands. They have sweat glands. They have these subcutaneous glands or pores. You know, so there's little things that are different. There's relatives that are different. There's there's so many strange and wonderful adaptations that hippos have. so much activity so hippos will now be starting to wake up to go out for the evening and she wants to be extra careful with her calf because at that age it is vulnerable to hyenas to lions to temperature changes it takes a bit of time <laughs> she doesn't like the sound of that it takes a bit of time to adjust really to that lifestyle And I'm sure she'll be spending a little bit less time away from the dam than the other hippos because the dam is the safety net at this point. The safety puddle. <laughs> so they'll probably feed in the open areas very close to the dam and not really venture much further. Okay, the light is dropping pretty quickly here, so I think we're going to leave the hippos, but I will wait for some answers and definitely get back to them when you come back to me a bit later. For now, I will send you over to Pridelands to see what they've got. We managed to find a few buffalo bulls. Two boys are just sitting there ruminating. They have not decided yet to, to get up and walk. We've got some buffalo as well. That's quite exciting. I decided to drive around a bit. There's an elephant bull, but I can't show it now. It's right I'm in our way. Um, it's going to come closer just now. Young boy. And let's take a look at these two boys. Buffalo bulls, or dugger boys as we refer to them. The dugger is a sort of slang name for, for cement and mud. Referring to them always being covered in mud these old bulls very often and they're just having a good old snooze probably gonna start getting active now we'll probably stand up and then we'll probably go and graze a bit looking in good condition these two boys I tell you that
here comes the elephant bull. He's now on the way. It's a young boy. It's a teenager. Hello. He's going to come into our view just now. Hello, young man. I'm coming to investigate what we are. We're a safari vehicle with a cameraman and a naturalist. Sinak, hello there. Sinak wants to know if I've ever been charged by buffalo. As uh, Sinak, indeed, by an old bull, very similar like what you had there. Once a couple of times with the vehicle, one actually connected my door. We were watching a leopard, and it ran straight into my vehicle. I, unlike our vehicles we use here, this one still had a door, and I had to jump out to the passenger seat and he bent the door pretty badly I've had some on foot as well unfortunately those never ended up in either me or the buffalo being hurt it is a scary thing I can tell you that because I have a tendency when they start charging that they do not stop the problem. I enjoy watching buffalo as much as I watch like to enjoy elephants, like to watch them. And you can look at that face, quite menacing. Look at that guy, he's going to lie down flat on his side, which is not often you see that. Now remember, they are ruminants, they cannot sleep like that for long periods, usually only for a few moments, and it's just to rest the neck. The problem in that is, when they lie like that and they're not upright, like the one to his right, the juices in its big stomach, the rumen, will push up into the throat and they can suffocate, they can actually internally drown. That's why you very seldom see ruminants lying flat on their side. They're always lying kind of like upright on their legs folded in. So the stomach is upright in line with the head. He's a bit annoyed now that the young elephant bull has chased him up. Small elephants I can see in the background. Yeah. There's just elephants all over Pridelands at the moment. It is incredible, absolutely incredible how many elephants are around. Would you like a stay in the African bush? Open to all explorers. Sign up and stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two at the fantastic Mashatu Lodge in Botswana. This bucket list prize includes daily safari drives, traditional African cuisine, 
spacious luxury suites, and a promise of sheer relaxation. Sign up now and stand a chance to win. I'm wondering if any picked up anyone picked up the trick question in my questions. Ah, oh, I suppose we shall see. Okay, I'm traveling on one of the boundaries of Juma looking for leopards. I need to find a leopard for my soul. It's a complete and amazing day. Oh, here I come out some answers I'm excited. shall see. Morgan. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're good. Kimberly, you think the closest relative is a rhino that it can weigh up to 70 pounds. That one's actually not bad. And I think you're trying to say norsudoric acid. I think I heard that, Morgan, if you can confirm that for me. But Kimberly, you're almost on the money, especially with the weight of 70 pounds. It could actually be a little bit more than that, but I like that answer. Unfortunately, the closest relative is not a rhino, but I can see why you chose that. Because I would too, if I didn't know any better. What? Oh, leopard tracks. Thank you. Oh, into. Okay. Jenna, you're also pretty close. You think an elephant is the closest relative? Again, I see the logic here, but it's not correct. 50 kilograms, more on the money. That's about the maximum weight a calf can be. And blood sweat is the nickname that we have for that kind of reddish, sunscreeny kind of vibe that the hippos have, that kind of secretion, mucusy secretion. So you're not wrong on the blood sweat, but that's the nickname for what it looks like, I suppose. It's not actually blood, nor is it actually sweat, but that's the nickname, it's called blood sweat. And yes, a hippo calf can be anywhere from 35 kilos to 50 kilos, so that was good. Elaine, Dax and Ruby Emerald, it seems like you three were definitely completely on the money. So you were 
Right, whales, dolphins and porpoises, so the cetaceans are actually the closest relative of a hippo and that evolutionary branch actually took whales, dolphins and porpoises into the water rather than the other way around. So it's interesting that they're more closely related to our sea mammals than they are to land mammals, but you can see where it comes in. Both are water-based more than anything. The weight of a baby hippo calf when it's born can be anywhere from 35 to 50 kilograms. Igor is seeing something and pointing manically. What am I missing? I still don't know what I'm missing. Is it gone? Okay. <laughs> okay, and then, oh, there, I got it. Now it's gone. It was a bird of prey, a little raptor. And it's disappeared into the marula tree. It looked like it might have been either a lizard buzzard or a black winged kite, that kind of size. A black shouldered kite. It is kind of still there, but I don't know if we'll get it. It might be covered by a branch. We can try. <laughs> Very far back in the marula. And the third and final question is yes, it is hipposudoric acid. There's also an orangish compound, so that's the red one. There's an orangey one called norhiposudoric acid, and the combination gives it a red orange rusty brown color that acts as sunscreen but nobody picked up the trick in my question there's a trick and I said it's also in pink milk there's a trick in my question nobody picked it up I'm sad now so there's a lot of questions flying around about whether hippos really have pink milk and this comes from the fact that hipposudoric acid it has a antimicrobial agent in it <laughs> we can't find the bird, but that's okay, we can keep chatting anyway. Um, so it's got an antimicrobial agent in it, which not only acts as a sunscreen, but also acts to try and protect any open wounds because hippos fight a lot, right? So big male hippos, when they fight, will cut each other's skin, and so it has that antimicrobial agent to help fight any bacteria and microbes that might be harmful that are in the water from the buildup of dung and, you know, all of these things that animals do when they find water. The trick here comes in because there's a lot of rumors flying around that hippos have pink milk. It's not actually pink, there's no scientific evidence to show that it's pink, but we think maybe, or I think my theory is the reason it comes up is because that antimicrobial agent in hipposidoric acid is really beneficial for the calf in terms of protecting its immune system against everything in the water once it's born. So I think that's where the trick comes in, but nobody picked up that it was a trick question. <laughs> There is no scientific evidence to prove that hippos have pink milk, but I think personally that's where the confusion came in because if you take hipposidoric acid and its antimicrobial agents or properties, add that to a mother's milk, you would think the red combined with the white would make pink, as it does. However, in this instance, it actually doesn't. <laughs> it just happens to benefit the hippo calf. Yay, thank you so much for the answers, everyone. That was a really good one. And I know hippos are particularly confusing because they are in the water, we think, because they look similar to, and they're a similar size to rhinos and elephants, that that's their closest relatives. In fact, an elephant's closest relative is a dussy or a hyrax, which is this big and very fluffy. And a rhino's closest relative is a zebra. So completely different to what you would expect. And there comes the hippo with Dolphins, porpoises, and whales. Cetaceans. <laughs> oh, I love that. That was one of my favorite quizzes I've done. Thank you for the answers, and well done to those that got it right. I, I, uh, I had fun doing that one. For now, I'll send you over to Taylor somewhere on the other side of Juma, and I will keep looking for a lemon. We're going to try this again because we seem to have been having another problem and I would like to finish my story and redeem myself. Of course this always happens. Anyways, so I'll try again but let me finish my story. So anyways, so basically what was happening is while we were, well, trying to fix this car for this these people, I explained the technique to a couple of people, uh, gentlemen and they tried it but I don't think that they'd ever done the technique before because they couldn't get it right. So I, I asked very nicely if I could just have one go 
thankfully I did it and it worked first time and then I just said to the ladies don't stop but I don't think it's any sense as I'd just get your battery checked out if you said you weren't having any starting problems um because that's sometimes what happens but anyways let's try that again so you have to have your car in neutral to begin with or you can put your foot on the clutch and have it in second gear and ideally you need to be on a slope or you're gonna have to have people pushing you and you need to build up a bit of a bit of speed so i'm gonna put the car in second gear my foot is on the clutch and then i'm gonna take the brake off we're just parked on a bit of a bolster which is um, a little heap of sand and you can see there's a little mitre drain uh, built off to the right that's just uh, a way to stop runoff of water otherwise we you know we ruin the roads okay so you're going to build up a fair amount of speed. You don't need to be racing, racing 60 kilometers an hour. Like this is pretty good. We can actually go into third gear for this now. And then now we're driving. Obviously just remember to accelerate or to put your foot back on the clutch again. I'm going to just slow down a little bit because we're going downhill. But um, it's quite a, for squeaky brakes, I'm not sure. But anyways, it's quite a nice little technique uh, to learn. It's definitely something that has saved me quite a few times. And you can do it on your own. Um, the nice thing about not having a door, and if the road is obviously not uphill, uh, you, you can do it in reverse though as well, if you were facing the other way, um, is and you can literally do the Fred, Fred Flintstone thing where you run next to the car, but it's obviously much easier because we've got an open, an open door. Definitely done that a few times too. Um, so yeah, that's just a, a little technique to use. No, no, I didn't have enough thing. Hello, actually let's look here. Just rolling forward. Shh, car. Lemon. Shush. There is a lilac breasted roller. Oh, car still wants to go. You can't go anywhere now. But it is silhouetted up on a tree, as you can see. Hello, beautiful bird. <laughs> Oliver, I'm glad that you, you learned something new. I feel like a complete fool though when, when I do these things all the time and they work perfectly. But then of course when I brag about them, then, you know, karma's like, stay in your lane and be humble. Fair enough. Learned my lesson. Anyways, Lilac Breasted Rona, are you hoping to catch some insects that are uh, now going to awaken because uh, believe it or not we have nocturnal insect and insects and also diurnal insects so i think we've had most of the allate explosions uh since the rain maybe we'll get another one tonight but last night i didn't see any but it, i did see the night before there were plenty and i always find that the the roller species as well as the forktail drongos they love staying up in the sort of crepuscular period the sort of last light in the evening especially in summer it's still nice and warm and they'll take advantage of the insects that uh, come alive at night as sort of like one last boost of food and there's not that much competition most of the birds you can hear it's gone completely quiet they've you know chosen their perches for the evening or their holes or nests or wherever they are and uh you know are not really feeding so it's a good opportunity for them we actually watched it the one evening um just near just near gari dam where we had a pair of lilac breasted rollers also silhouetted just swooping around and, and catching insects that were flying around there we go oh up it goes oh, oh it's chasing it's actually chasing an insect it caught it it's going back where is it gone Oh, it's not going to come back to the same perch. What a pity. It actually chased quite a large insect and caught it in the air. Very cool. But anyways, we'll carry on now. That was brilliant. Okay, no, we'll just do this thing I just did now. Right. Takes us. Beautiful, thanks so much, Peter. I will definitely do that. Thank you. Yeah, they really don't fall another kilometer. I will explain this in a second. Thank you so much. I'm on my way. Stand by at the garden gate. They come straight on the fence line. 
Thank you. So it seems like the SH mail and the Talamati breakaways are on their way to Gauri Gate. Hmm. This is exciting. Because we haven't seen them in a while. And it seems like they're on the fence line coming from a property called Simambidi, so that's northwest in Juma, so where I am now. West is that way, so I would need to keep going along this road and then up to the right. So I need to be heading in that direction, which is great news for me because I'm already on the way there. And it seems like they might not get there in the next five minutes or ten minutes, but they might be there in the next half hour. So that's perfect. I'm heading there. So that's the plan in case you wanted to know. Which, you know, is always good. <laughs> but we are very lucky, I must just say. Um, we are incredibly lucky with, with the guides that we work with from the other properties. They really do look after us. Um, I mean, he went out of his way there to, to ask what time we're on safari until to make sure if I have enough time, I must come to the gate because I'm sure you'd all love to see those, those lines. If, fingers crossed, we get lucky. Maybe Taylor is even closer and she can go there instead. But at least we've heard the update now and Morgan, the lovely voice in my ear, We'll communicate that to Taylor as well, if Taylor didn't catch it on the radio. So cool. Let's go that way. I'm glad I took this route. I don't know why my gut told me to come this way, but happy. Happy, happy. Let's hope we can get some lions. Starbuck, thank you so much for coming on safari with me. I do appreciate it. It is very nice to hear when somebody um, appreciates what we do and, and enjoys us. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but that's okay. I love being in the bush and I think that's all that matters. But thank you very much, Starbuck. I really appreciate you and your mom. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being on the back of the vehicle with me. Eagle likes me, right? <laughs> Far too cheeky, sir Eagle. Far too cheeky. <laughs> Max. <laughs> Morgan says I shouldn't trust what Eagle says. I agree. I agree. But Maximilian, I'm also hoping for a tawny Tuesday, a little bit of tawny luck. I know that was how we started our afternoon, hoping for some tawny luck. So let's hope it actually happens and we do get some tawny luck. Luckily, we have still got time. So I'm keeping the pace pretty constant. I'm still looking for other animals. Obviously, I'm not driving fast at all, just faster than the snail pace I'm usually at. So I'm channeling my inner Turbo Taylor. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. She's not Turbo. She always goes. She always goes Tortoise Taylor. But I suppose when there's dogs around, that's when we engage Turbo mode. The two T's, the twins, the terrible twos. <laughs> so I'm 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 mid Tortoise and Turbo at this point. What's the word for that eagle? Okay, no. Hey? Moderately paced Tess. All right, we'll go with moderately paced Tess. Where's Taylor? She's, she's roll starting Taylor today. <laughs> Jump start Taylor, roll start Taylor. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, Lisa, on the waterholes, I'm your cup of smilo. Thank you. 
Thank you. That's a good little private joke as well because I'm very particular about my Milo. <laughs> but thank you, Lisa. You're my cup of Milo every day. Every day. I think it's the most important thing that you can do in the bush always is smile and be passionate and enthusiastic and then no matter what you're doing, it works. It helps. Eagle, what are you laughing at? Would you like to share or? It's very important. Okay. Yes, that's a good point. You sh probably shouldn't try and give elephants a hug in the bush, but smiling, definitely, you can try smiling in the bush. Yeah. And as much as many people may have wanted to take the baby hippo home, that's probably also not a good idea. Don't mess with mama. <laughs> Always smile. Learn something new. <laughs> Okay, so we are nearly on the main road of Juma, which will take us straight to the gate where those lions are due to pop out. Oh, tawny, 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 tawny black on Tuesday. Come on, tawny. This is actually one of my favorite sections of the whole property. It starts getting really thick here, so I'm sure you can see the vegetation next to me has really become a bit of a wall. This is excellent for nyalas, kudus, dikers, hyenas, leopards. Oh, so good, so good. But also birds, nice and quiet, but at the same time, at the same time as it's quiet, it's filled with bush sounds, so it's the nice kind of peaceful quiet. Okay, let me see if I can get to those tawny cats and I'll send you to Taylor to see what she's up to. We are bumbling, although we did uh, discover female leopard tracks that come along Mvubu Road and, and that's basically where the dam is, where Gauri Dam is. I just want to switch off because we can also actually just listen to what's going on. Um, and they, they basically comes past the dam and then heads sort of to, to the north and then gets to the end of Juma, the most northern section of Juma and crosses over to, into Buffalo's Hook where we, we unfortunately can't ride there. But basically why I say it's interesting is because this morning Tessa was following female leopard tracks and she had them going around on different roads and then they sort of popped onto the open plains uh the quarantine open plains and then she couldn't find them anymore so that she must have snuck somewhere and has gone straight basically to uh Tambuti pan or dam i forget which one it is so i don't know who it could have been it, they're not big footprints they don't look like shadulu footprints to me not that i really think shadulu would be coming this way but we also saw her all the way at treehouse dam a couple of days ago so I'm not sure. They look like little feet, so I'm wondering if they're maybe Tlalambas. This would not be unusual for her to be up and around this section. But of course, I think it's quite difficult to, to tell. So just that we come and bumble around here and just check. So I haven't actually driven in Bubu Road for a few days now. And I, I quite enjoy driving this road. I also wanted to, to wish... Um, Pippa Mulman, who is of course one of the landowners of Juma, a happy birthday. So if you do hear some singing and songs on the dam camp, enjoy, you know, maybe make a toast because without them we would not be here and uh, have Juma. So happy birthday. Right, there's something in the tree there. I'm going to try and figure out what it is. It's a bird of prey. It's obviously dark now. Who are you? Oh, I think it's the lesser spotted eagle. 
It's going to be quite difficult to see. So I'm looking with my binoculars and I can see a little bit more color. It, uh, the lesser spotted eagles and the tawny eagles look very, very similar. Not tawny eagles. I don't know why I said tawny eagle. I meant to say Wahlberg eagle. Very, very similar. And I was actually going through the differences the other day. And there has been a lesser spotted eagle. Fly, uh, eagle in, lesser spotted eagle. Oh, if he sits in the sun too long, then he'll become a lesser spotted eagle. Um, eagle and I didn't see its tail though if it was slightly more fanned out because the Warburg's eagle's tail is very narrow but then it also had some white flecks on it which is quite common but in terms of coloration if it's obviously not a uh, pale morph Warburg's eagle you know then you can tell the difference and it was sitting perfectly up there and I could see most sides of its head and I didn't see a little crest which is another characteristic that the Warburg's eagle has so I'm going to go with less the spotted also one of our migratory eagles music now it sounds like a fun party do you think that i can just maybe invite myself later hi hi everybody i'm here i've never gate crashed a party in my entire life before i'd, I'd be too terrified i'm very afraid of rejection so i probably won't be doing that but i'm sure that they're going to have the most wonderful time and there's nothing quite like having a celebration in the bush, right? I think it's quite cool. I've spent most of my adult life in, on safari. Uh, yeah, ex you know, enjoying my birthdays. Hello, my name is Melanie and I'm sitting in freezing cold Hobart, Tasmania which is a small island off the coast of Australia. I became an explorer for Wild Earth quite a number of years ago when they first advertised the positions. I'm so excited about winning the Rock Fig um, Prize, uh, which will be in the big way, and I cannot wait to have that adventure. And I thank the organisers um, so much for this opportunity. Moderately paced Tess still on a mission to go towards where the lions are hoping, or well, I'm hoping they'll pop out anyway. Let's hope. But Taylor, I really hope you find that uh, leopard, you found some leopard tracks. We heard when we came over the dam wall at Gauri Dam, the main dam, where Taylor is just about. We heard some Franklin's alarm calling. Quite a few of them down on the other side of the dam wall. Maybe the 
leopard is already there. I don't know if the tracks are going towards the dam or away from the dam, but worth letting you know, Taylor. Worth letting you know. We didn't see anything, but but uh, definitely could be around there. Maybe we missed it by a couple of minutes. Very possible. So this morning I had leopard tracks right here, where I am now. A male and a female. So I think whichever leopards are around are walking circles around us. That can only lead me to believe it might be Falamba and then either tortoise pan or um, Tavangumi. Also, speaking of, because I know everybody is uh, interested in what's going on, Langa was seen on Chitwa. So Langa is looking really healthy and there was a sighting of Mulawati. What? The ghost? There was a sighting of the ghost. There's something in the road walking towards us. It looks fairly large. I'm going to take the light off of it rather. I think it might be a hyena. Are these potentially the same leopard tracks we had this morning? Of a male coming up? Coming down. Oh. That looks too skinny to be a hyena. That looks too skinny. You know, hyenas are a bit chunkier, but I might be wrong. It is not time. I'm going to pull off the road because I don't want to block any pathways. That might be... Oh, I don't know. Actually, it walks like a hyena. What do you think, Eagle? It's very dark at the naked eye. I think it's a hyena. Yes, it's a hyena. Yay. So much luck. So much luck. Maybe following the leopard tracks. Hello, hyena. We shall wait patiently for you to come past and see who you are. This is some great luck. switching sides of the road <laughs> and I'm trying to move out of the way. <laughs> Hello Aina. is Rusty interesting? <laughs> Not so sure. <laughs> Although, to be fair, I was hiding down under the seat, so I wouldn't get in the way. Oh, Liz, thank you. A little bit of last minute luck is always the best. This hyena doesn't look overly relaxed. The way that it kind of came and sniffed at the vehicle. Let's stop here and just let it walk a bit, and then we can try and catch up if we want to. So, I didn't recognize any markings, but I just had a glimpse at the screen because it's, it's really dark, I had a glimpse at the screen as it was walking past. If anyone has a positive ID on that hyena for us, please do let us know. It has stopped now. It's sniffing. There it goes again. So when a hyena walks in a straight line like this, it's definitely on a bit of a mission. It's often when they're moving from one area to another looking for other hyenas, or when they're on the trail of another predator, or perhaps they've been at a carcass or investigating something and they're heading back towards where the rest of the family might be, particularly if they have cubs. Ah, oh, Shreyas, this is Mufambi. Thank you so much. So this is a male, I believe, a wandering male that uh, hasn't been sighted altogether that recently. If 
I'm not mistaken, the last sighting of Mufambi, at least on, on Wild Earth, was quite a while ago. Quite a while ago. I'm very torn now. Tawny Tuesday spotted hyena. Okay, let's see if we can follow the spotted hyena for a little bit. And then we come back. And then we come back. I have got my radio on in case the lines are getting much closer to the gate. In which case, we'll pick it up going that way. For now, we've got a hyena. I haven't spent much time with my family. I'd like to spend a bit more time. Wow, that's so exciting. So this is an immigrant hyena, if I'm not mistaken. Fumbi means traveler or wanderer. Moving. Very nice fitting name. Okay, and I will very openly tell you now. This hyena is not sticking around. It's just picked up speed and disappeared down the road. Absolutely disappeared. Oh, Rusty's moving. You might just see the last little bit there headed straight towards where Taylor is so I think it might be going to look for that leopard I'm not going to follow with a hyena running like that purely because it's so dark that if it is running for something like wild dogs we don't want to view them in infrared so I won't do that to them but also Taylor is on that side she will know that there's a hyena coming towards her now and um, maybe it'll even help her find the leopard but uh, I'm not going to follow a running hyena like that purely because it's on a mission for a reason. It probably doesn't need us trailing it right now. It just is a bit of a... Come on, Rusty. There we go. Cause a bit of a, an extra stress that it doesn't need. But that was really cool. We'll find me for the win. Some spots for the day. All right. Let us get back to our mission. Only Tuesday. That was really fun. racking my brain now for where Mufambi comes from. If I'm not mistaken, seen a lot around Elephant Plains. Am I correct, Trace? Do let me know. I know um, Mufambi was seen a lot on some camera traps, and cams, if I'm not mistaken as well. Very interesting. Nice to see Mufambi around. Well done, Tessa. What a find. Oh, man. I haven't seen a spotted hyena for myself in quite some time. So once again, I'm left jealous. But please do enjoy and uh, soak all of that up. I'm just soaking up the sun right now. The last bit of sun we are having here in Okokoyo. As you can see, it's slowly getting dark. And uh, no lions to report yet. There have been some springbok that came for a last drink and took off again. But sadly, my unicorn has not come yet. Nor have my elephants. Or my giraffes. <laughs> but that is perfectly fine. As I say, I am just super, super chilled with this beautiful sunset. How can you not be satisfied? This is just breathtaking. All right, I will <laughs> succumb to looking for one last time. Just making sure, you know, perhaps no one is approaching. Temptation, temptation. That's the thing about Mother Nature. The more you get, the more you want. And sometimes it's just good to appreciate all of the smaller things and the simpler things. Such as a beautiful sunset like this. The bird calls. The springbok in the background. 
It's just nice. We've got a termite mound. Can't run away from us. Um, so I want to tell you a story about what happened here two evenings ago, which was quite spectacular. So this termite mound you all know very well because it, it's the, the termite mound that we all stop at on quarantine. And it's a very productive termite mound. And two nights ago, it was releasing, my goodness, hundreds of uh, future kings and queen termites and it obviously caused quite a stir because there was all sorts of birds that were still lingering around quite late uh, into the evening and then I heard something rustling in the grass and it was a white-tailed mongoose so the white-tailed mongoose was here trying to of course catch as many of the termites as possible but it didn't climb onto the top of the mound it was kind of sort of lingering off where Mpo is panning to now but it was so funny because it was leaping into the air and trying to catch them as they were flying so I was hoping I was like maybe maybe there's some late alates that haven't been released yet you know but no not tonight unfortunately but I'm gonna do a quick scan anyways uh, I would love to know where this white-tailed mongoose lives because there's there's obviously a female we know there's a female that lives up here because at one point she had youngsters she had pups so um, yeah, I mean, it would be quite cool, of course, if one would arrive, but sadly not. So we shall continue to search for chameleons. Let's go look for a chameleon. I was hoping we'd maybe see one on one of these trees as I sit here, but that's not the case. Start! There we go. I'm going to yell at Lemon. Um, Millie, yes, it is true that termite mounds are extremely hot and very humid um, and that's because this particular species of termite is a large fungus growing termite so they actually grow their own food uh, they aren't capable of you know digesting the cellulose and other plant materials um, like some maybe some other species of termites are able to do so it's super important that they uh, that they grow their own food little farmers uh, so that's why it's got to be nice and moist there are these really cool chambers and then the, the fungi sort of grows on it. it almost looks like gills within the termite mound a little foal Woo! what are you and why are you buzzing around my head sorry i don't know what that was but I, and i'm not scared but i am scared of something going down my ear canal and i've heard of that happening before and i'm fine thank you and the doctors are far away and i will not be putting oil or water or anything else in there to try and kill it no thank you so I'd rather not experience anything along those lines. I'm turning the lights off on front. I'm not having them on. I'm only going to have my spotlight out. And I already had to douse my eyes um, with an antihistamine eye drop just a moment ago. And then I also panicked because as I went from this position to this position, it obviously the drop stripped down my eyes and my mouth was open because I never stopped talking. So I ingested some of the eye drops. Don't know how great that is for you, but anyways. Um, I'm still here and I feel fine. What are you? It's so unnecessary. As long as they're, actually, as long as they're not stink bugs, it's fine. I'm gonna have to drive like this. I'm gonna close one ear because the other ear's got an earpiece in, so there's no ways they can get in. Um, koala paws. So it's quite. It's not too difficult for termites to uh, survive when you have other creatures. I'm actually just gonna stop other creatures uh, living in the mound and um, so sometimes that those animals that are living inside they actually are not interested at all in uh, in eating them and you know they're really just using that mound as a particular shelter but also those chambers are not necessarily going to be active so if you've ever stuck your head into a active termite mound and uh, you would have noticed that one of the open chimneys that quite often there's soldiers and workers that are are there waiting at the entrance just on the inside oh let's go to Tess oh my goodness in the nick of time the nick of time 
<sighs> Two minutes to go. Tawny Tuesdays. Complete, moderately placed. Tess has done it. Yay. <laughs> what a fantastic end to an exceptionally good day in the African bush. I cannot believe our luck right now. These are the Talamati breakaways. This is one of the lionesses leading the rest. Moving, there come the rest on the road. <laughs> Thank you so much to everybody who joined us for a fantastic sunset safari. It really has been spectacular. This is the perfect end to the day and hopefully we get to catch up with them. Fingers crossed they cross into Juma and stick around. For now though, we will be saying goodnight from myself, Igor and the rest of the Safari Live crew. Or good morning, wherever you are. Whichever one it is, I hope it is a really, really pleasant day or night for you. We will be out and about bright and early tomorrow morning, 5.30 a.m. Central African time, hopefully with more tawny luck. going to join some lions for Sunday lunch. We're going to see a predator become lunch and we're going to see some birds setting a very good example by preparing lunch. Let's push play on this episode of The Wild Show.